Prefatory Note, Introduction, and Proem to the Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Prefatory Note. 2SFA after some deliberation, and at the risk of offending the sensibility of scholars, I have adopted the old English spelling of Michelangelo's name, feeling that no orthographical accuracy can outweigh the associations implied in that familiar title. Michelangelo has a place among the highest, with Homer and Titian, with Virgil and Petrarch, with Raphael and Paul. Nor do I imagine that any alteration for the better would be effected by substituting for these time-honored names Homero and Tiziano, Virgilius and Petrarca, Raffaello and Paulus. I wish here to express my heartiest thanks to Signore Pasquale Villari for valuable assistance kindly rendered in the interpretation of some difficult passages of Campanella, and to Signore V. de Tivoli for calling my attention to the sonnet of Michelangelo deciphered by him on the back of a drawing in the Taylor Gallery at Oxford. Portions both of the introduction and the translations forming this volume have already appeared in the Contemporary Review in the Cornhill Magazine. Davos Platz December 1877. Introduction. 1. It is with diffidence that I offer a translation of Michelangelo's sonnets, for the first time completely rendered into English rhyme, and that I venture on a version of Campanella's philosophical poems. My excuse, if I can plead any for so bold an attempt, may be found in this, that, so far as I am aware, no other English writer has dealt with Michelangelo's verses since the publication of his autograph, while Campanella's sonnets have hitherto been almost utterly unknown. Something must be said to justify the issue of poems so dissimilar in a single volume. Michelangelo and Campanella represent widely sundered, though almost contemporaneous, movements in the evolution of the Italian genius. Michelangelo was essentially an artist, living in the prime of the Renaissance. Campanella was a philosopher, born when the Counter-Reformation was doing all it could to blight the free thought of the sixteenth century, and when the modern spirit of exact inquiry, in a few philosophical martyrs, was opening a new stage for European science. The one devoted all his mental energies to the realization of beauty, the other strove to ascertain truth. The one clung to Ficino's dream of Platonizing Christianity, the other constructed for himself a new theology, founded on the conception of God imminent in nature. Michelangelo expressed the aspirations of a solitary life dedicated to the service of art, at a time when art received the suffrage and the admiration of all Italy. Campanella gave utterance to a spirit, exiled and isolated, misunderstood by those with whom he lived, at a moment when philosophy was hunted down as heresy and imprisoned as treason to the public wheel. The marks of this difference in the external and internal circumstances of the two poets might be multiplied indefinitely, yet they had much in common. Both stood above their age, and in a sense aloof from it. Both approached poetry in the spirit of thinkers bent upon extricating themselves from the trivialities of contemporary literature. The sonnets of both alike are contributions to philosophical poetry in an age when the Italians had lost their ancient manliness and energy. Both were united by the ties of study and affection to the greatest singer of their nation, Dante, at a time when Petrarch, thrice deluded and emasculated, was the Phoebus of academies and coteries. This common antagonism to the degenerate genius of Italian literature is the link which binds Michelangelo, the veteran giant of the Renaissance, to Campanella, the audacious titan of the modern age. 2. My translation of Michelangelo's sonnets has been made from Signor Cesare Guasti's edition of the autograph, first given to the world in 1863. This masterpiece of laborious and minute scholarship is based upon a collation of the various manuscripts preserved in the Casa Buonarroti at Florence with the Vatican and other codices. It adheres to the original orthography of Michelangelo and omits no fragment of his indubitable compositions. Signor Guasti prefaces the text he has so carefully prepared with a discourse upon the poetry of Michelangelo and a description of the manuscripts. To the poems themselves he adds a prose paraphrase, and prints upon the same page with each composition the version published by Michelangelo Buonarroti in 1623. Before the publication of this volume, all studies of Michelangelo's poetry, all translations made of it, and all hypotheses deduced from the sculptor's verse in explanation of his theory or his practice as an artist were based upon the edition of 1623. It will not be superfluous to describe what that edition was, and how its text differed from that now given to the light, in order that the relation of my own English version to those which have preceded it may be rightly understood. 
Michelangelo seems to have entertained no thought of printing his poems in his lifetime. He distributed them freely among his friends, of whom Sebastiano del Piombo, Luigi del Riccio, Donato Gianotti, Vittoria Colonna, and Tommaso de Cavalieri were in this respect the most favored. In course of time some of these friends, partly by the gift of the originals and partly by obtaining copies, formed more or less complete collections, and it undoubtedly occurred to more than one to publish them. Ascanio Condivi, at the close of his biography, makes this announcement. I hope ere long to make public some of his sonnets and madrigals, which I have been long collecting, both from himself and others who possessed them, with the view to proving to the world the force of his inventive genius and the beauty of the thoughts produced by that divine spirit. Condivi's promise was not fulfilled. With the exception of two or three pieces printed by Vasari and the extracts quoted by Varchi in his Lezione, the poems of Michelangelo remained in manuscript for fifty-nine years after his death. The most voluminous collection formed part of the Buonarroti archives, but a large quantity preserved by Luigi da Riccio, and from him transferred to Fulvio Orsini, had passed into the Vatican Library, when Michelangelo the Younger conceived the plan of publishing his granduncle's poetry. Michelangelo obtained leave to transcribe the Vatican manuscripts with his own hand, and after taking pains to collate all the autographs and copies in existence, he set himself to compare their readings and to form a final text for publication. Here, however, began what we may call the tragedy of his rifacimento. The more he studied his great ancestor's verses, the less he liked or dared to edit them unaltered. Some of them expressed thoughts and sentiments offensive to the church. In some, the Florentine patriots spoke over boldly. Others exposed their author to misconstruction on the score of personal morality. All were ungrammatical, rude in versification, crabbed and obscure in thought, the rough-hewn blockings out of poems rather than finished works of art, as it appeared to the scrupulous, decorous, elegant, and timorous academician of a feebler age. While pondering these difficulties and comparing the readings of his many manuscripts, the thought occurred to Michelangelo that, between leaving the poems unpublished and printing them in all their rugged boldness, lay the middle course of reducing them to smoothness of diction, lucidity of meaning, and propriety of sentiment. In other words, he began, as Signor Guasti pithily describes his method, to change halves of lines, whole verses, ideas. If he found a fragment, he completed it. If brevity involved the thought in obscurity, he amplified it. If the obscurity seemed incurable, he amputated. For superabundant wealth of conception, he substituted vacuity, smoothed asperities, softened salient lights. The result was that a medley of garbled phrases, additions, alterations, and sophistications was foisted on the world as the veritable product of the mighty sculptor's genius. That Michelangelo meant well to his illustrious ancestor is certain. That he took the greatest pains in executing his ungrateful and disastrous task is no less clear. But the net result of his meddlesome benevolence has been that now, for two centuries and a half, the greatest genius of the Italian Renaissance has worn the ill-fitting disguise prepared for him by a literary breeches-maker. In fact, Michelangelo the poet suffered no less from his grandnephew than Michelangelo the fresco painter from his follower Daniele da Volterra. Nearly all Michelangelo's sonnets expressed personal feelings, and by far the greater number of them were composed after his sixtieth year. To whom they were addressed we know only in a few instances. Vittoria Colonna and Tommaso de Cavalieri, the two most intimate friends of his old age in Rome, received from him some of the most pathetically beautiful of his love poems. But to suppose that either the one or the other was the object of more than a few well-authenticated sonnets would be hazardous. Nothing is more clear than that Michelangelo worshipped beauty in the platonic spirit, passing beyond its personal and specific manifestations to the universal and impersonal. This thought is repeated over and over again in his poetry, and if we bear in mind that he habitually regarded the loveliness of man or woman as a sign and symbol of eternal and immutable beauty, we shall feel it of no less importance to discover who it was that prompted him to this or that poetic utterance. That the loves of his youth were not so tranquil as those of his old age appears not only from the regrets expressed in his religious verses, but also from one or two of the rare sonnets referable to his manhood. The love of beauty, the love of Florence, and the love of Christ are the three main motives of his poetry. This is not the place to discuss at length the nature of his philosophy, his patriotism, or his religion, to inquire how far he retained the early teaching of Ficino and Savonarola, or to trace the influence of Dante and the Bible on his mind. I may, however, refer my readers who are interested in these questions to the discourse of Signor Guasti, the learned essay of Mr. J. E. Taylor, and the refined study of Mr. W. H. Pater. My own views will be found expressed in the third volume of my Renaissance in Italy, and where I think it necessary I shall take occasion to repeat them, 
in the notes appended to my translation. 3. Michelangelo's madrigals and sonnets were eagerly sought for during his lifetime. They formed the themes of learned academical discourses, and won for him the poet's crown in death. Upon his tomb the muse of song was carved in company with sculpture, architecture, and painting. Since the publication of the Rifacimento in 1623, his verses have been used among the testi di lingua by Italians, and have been studied in the three great languages of Europe. The fate of Campanella's philosophical poems has been very different. It was owing to a fortunate chance that they survived their author, and until the year 1834 they were wholly and entirely unknown in Italy. The history of their preservation is so curious that I cannot refrain from giving some account of it, before proceeding to sketch so much of Campanella's life and doctrine as may be necessary for the understanding of his sonnets. The poems were composed during Campanella's imprisonment at Naples, and from internal evidence there is good reason to suppose that the greater part of them were written at intervals in the first fourteen years of the twenty-five he passed in confinement. In the descriptive catalogue of his own works the philosopher mentions seven books of sonnets and canzoni, which he calls Le Cantiche. Whether any of these would have been printed but for a mere accident is doubtful. A German gentleman, named Tobia Adami, who is supposed to have been a court counsellor at Weimar, after travelling through Greece, Syria, and Palestine, in company with a young friend called Rodolf von Bunau, visited Campanella in his dungeon. A close intimacy sprang up between them, and Adami undertook to publish several works of the philosopher in testimony of his admiration. Among these were Le Cantiche. Instead, however, of printing the poems in extenso, he made a selection, choosing those apparently which took his fancy, and which, in his opinion, threw most light on Campanella's philosophical theories. It is clear that he neglected the author's own arrangement, since there is no trace of the division into seven books. What proportion the selection bore to the whole bulk of the manuscript seems to me uncertain, though the latest editor asserts that it formed only a seventh part. The manuscript itself is lost, and Adami's edition of the specimens is all that now remains as a basis for the text of Campanella's poems. This first edition was badly printed in Germany on very bad paper, without the name of press or place. Besides the poems, it contained a brief prose commentary by the editor, the value of which is still very great, since we have the right to suppose that Adami's explanations embodied what he had received by word of mouth from Campanella. The little book bore this title, Scelta d'alcune poesie filosofiche di Settimontano Squila cavate da suo libri detti la cantica, con l'esposizione stampato nell'anno 1622. The pseudonym of Squila is a pun upon Campanella's name, since both Campana and Squila mean a bell, while Settimontano contains a quaint allusion to the fact that the philosopher's skull was remarkable for seven protuberances. A very few copies of the unpretending little volume were printed, and none of these seem to have found their way into Italy, though it is possible that they had a certain circulation in Germany. At any rate, there is reason to suppose that Leibniz was not unacquainted with the poems, while Herder, in the Renaissance of German literature, published free translations from a few of the sonnets in his Adrastea. To this circumstance we owe the reprint of 1834, published at Lugano by John Gaspar Orelli, the celebrated Zurich scholar. Early in his youth, Orelli was delighted with the German version made by Herder, and during his manhood, while residing as Protestant pastor at Bergamo, he used his utmost endeavors to procure a copy of the original. In his preface to the reprint, he tells us that these efforts were wholly unsuccessful through a period of twenty-five years. He applied to all his literary friends, among whom he mentions the ardent Ugo Foscolo and the learned Mazzucchelli, but none of these could help him. He turned the pages of Crescimbeni, Quadrio, Gamba, Corniani, Tiraboschi, weighty with enormous erudition, and only those who make a special study of Italian know how little has escaped their scrutiny, but found no mention of Campanella as a poet. At last, after the lapse of a quarter of a century, he received the long-coveted little quarto volume from Wolfenbüttel in the north of Germany. The new edition which Orelli gave to the press at Lugano has this title, Poesie filosofiche di Tommaso Campanella, pubblicate per la prima volta in Italia da Giovanni Gaspare Orelli, professore all'Università di Zurigo, Lugano, 1834. The text has been again reprinted at Turin, in 1854, by Alessandro d'Ancona, together with some of Campanella's minor works and an essay on his life and writings. This third edition professes to have improved Orelli's punctuation, and to have rectified his readings. But it still leaves much to be desired on the score of careful editorship. Neither Orelli nor d'Ancona has done much to clear up the difficulties of the poems, difficulties in many cases obviously due to misprints and errors of the first transcriber, while in one or two instances they allow patent blunders to pass uncorrected. 
In the sonnet entitled Addio, for example, Bocca stands for Buca, in a place where sense and rhyme alike demand the restitution of the right word. At no time could the book have hoped for many readers. Least of all would it have found them among the Italians of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, to whom its energetic language and unfamiliar conceptions would have presented insuperable difficulties. Between Dante and Alfieri, no Italian poet except Michelangelo expressed so much deep thought and feeling in phrases so terse, and with originality of style so daring. And even Michelangelo was monotonous in the range of his ideas and uniform in his diction, when compared with the indescribable violence and vigor of Campanella. Campanella borrows little by way of simile or illustration from the outer world, and he never falls into the commonplaces of poetic phraseology. His poems exhibit the exact opposite of the petrarchistic or marinistic mannerism. Each sonnet seems to have been wrenched alive and palpitating from the poet's heart. There is no smoothness, no gradual unfolding of a theme, no rhetorical exposition, no fanciful embroidery, no sweetness of melodic cadence in his masculine art of poetry. Brusque, rough, violent in transition, leaping from the sublime to the ridiculous, his poems owe their elevation to the intensity of their feeling, the nobleness and condensation of their thought, the energy and audacity of their expression, their brevity, sincerity, and weight of sentiment. Campanella had an essentially combative intellect. He was both a poet and a philosopher militant. He stood alone, making war upon the authority of Aristotle and science, of Machiavelli and statecraft, and of Petrarch and art, taking the fortress of phrase by storm, and subduing the hardest material of philosophy to the tyranny of his rhymes. Plebeian saws, salient images, dry sentences of metaphysical speculation, logical summaries, and fiery tirades are hurled together, half crude and cindery scoriae, half molten metal and resplendent ore, from the volcano of his passionate mind. Such being the nature of Campanella's style, when in addition it is remembered that his text is sometimes hopelessly corrupt and his allusions obscure, the difficulties offered by his sonnets to the translator will be readily conceived. 4. At the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th centuries, philosophy took a new point of departure among the Italians, and all the fundamental ideas which have since formed the staple of modern European systems were anticipated by a few obscure thinkers. It is noticeable that the state of Naples, hitherto comparatively inert in the intellectual development of Italy, furnished the five writers who preceded Bacon, Leibniz, Schelling, and Comte, Telesio of Cosenza, Bruno of Nola, Campanella of Stilo, Vanini, and Vico of Naples, are the chief among these novi homines, or pioneers of modern thought. The characteristic point of this new philosophy was an unconditional return to nature as the source of knowledge combined with a belief in the intuitive forces of the human reason, so that from the first it showed two sides or faces to the world, the one positive, scientific, critical, and analytical, the other mystical, metaphysical, subjective. Modern materialism and modern idealism were both contained in the audacious guesses of Bruno and Campanella. Nor had the time arrived for clearly separating the two strains of thought, or for attempting a systematic synthesis of knowledge under one or the other head. The men who led this weighty intellectual movement burned with the passionate ardor of discoverers, the fiery enthusiasm of confessors. They stood alone, sustained but little by intercourse among themselves, and wholly misunderstood by the people round them. Italy, sunk in sloth, priest-ridden, tyrant-ridden, exhausted with the unparalleled activity of the Renaissance, besotted with the vices of slavery and slow corruption, had no ears for spirit-thrilling prophecy. The Church, terrified by the Reformation, when she chanced to hear those strange voices sounding through the blessed mutter of the mass, burned the prophets. The state, represented by absolute Spain, if it listened to them at all, flung them into prison. To both church and state there was peril in the new philosophy, for the new philosophy was the first birth-cry of the modern genius, with all the crudity and clearness, the brutality and uncompromising sincerity of youth. The church feared nature, the state feared the people. Nature and the people— those watchwords of modern science and modern liberty, were already on the lips of the philosophers. It was a philosophy armed, errant, exiled, a philosophy in chains and solitary, at war with society, authority, opinion, self-sustained by the prescience of ultimate triumph, and invincible through the sheer force of passionate conviction. The men of whom I speak were conscious of pariahdom, and eager to be martyred in the glorious cause. A very Proteus is the philosopher, says Pomponazzo, Seeking to penetrate the secrets of God, he is consumed with ceaseless cares. He forgets to thirst, to hunger, to sleep, to eat. He is derided of all men. He is held for a fool and irreligious person. He is persecuted by inquisitors. He becomes a gazing-stock to the common folk. 
These are the gains of the philosopher. These are his guerdon. Pompanazzo's words were prophetic. Of the five philosophers whom I mentioned, Vanini was burned as an atheist, Bruno was burned, and Campanella was imprisoned for a quarter of a century. Both Bruno and Campanella were Dominican friars. Bruno was persecuted by the church, and burned for heresy. Campanella was persecuted by both church and state, and was imprisoned on the double charge of sedition and heresy. Dormitantium animarum excubitor was the self-given title of Bruno. Nunquam tacebo was the favorite motto of Campanella. Giovanni Domenico Campanella was born in the year 1568 at Stilo in Calabria, one of the most southern townships of all Italy. In his boyhood he showed a remarkable faculty for acquiring and retaining knowledge, together with no small dialectical ability. His keen interest in philosophy and his admiration for the great Dominican doctors Thomas Aquinas and Albertus Magnus induced him at the age of fifteen to enter the order of St. Dominic, exchanging his secular name for Tommaso. But the old alliance between philosophy and orthodoxy, drawn up by scholasticism and approved by the medieval church, had been succeeded by mutual hostility, and the youthful thinker found no favor in the cloister of Cosenza, where he now resided. The new philosophy taught by Telesio placed itself in direct antagonism to the pseudo aristotelian tenets of the theologians, and founded its own principles upon the interrogation of nature. Telesio, says Bacon, was the prince of the novi homines, or inaugurators of modern thought. It was natural that Campanella should be drawn towards this great man. But the superiors of his convent prevented his forming the acquaintance of Telesio, and though the two men dwelt in the same city of Cosenza, Campanella never knew the teacher he admired so passionately. Only when the old man died and his body was exposed in the church before burial did the neophyte of philosophy approach the bier and pray beside it and place palms upon the dead. From this time forward Campanella became an object of suspicion to his brethren. They perceived that the fire of the new philosophy burned in his powerful nature with incalculable and explosive force. He moved restlessly from place to place, learning and discussing, drawing men towards him by the magnetism of a noble personality, and preaching his new gospel with perilous audacity. His papers were seized at Bologna, and at Rome the Holy Inquisition condemned him to perpetual incarceration on the ground that he derived his science from the devil, that he had written the book De Tribus Impostoribus, that he was a follower of Democritus, and that his opposition to Aristotle savored of gross heresy. At the same time, the Spanish government of Naples accused him of having set foot on a dangerous conspiracy for overthrowing the viceregal power and establishing a communistic commonwealth in southern Italy. Though nothing was proved satisfactorily against him, Campanella was held a prisoner under the sentence which the Inquisition had pronounced upon him. He was, in fact, a man too dangerous, too original in his opinions, and too bold in their enunciation to be at large. For twenty-five years he remained in Neapolitan dungeons. Three times during that period he was tortured to the verge of dying, and at last he was released, while quite an old man, at the urgent request of the French court. Not many years after his liberation, Campanella died. The numerous philosophical works on metaphysics, mathematics, politics, and aesthetics, which Campanella gave to the press, were composed during his long imprisonment. How they came to be printed I do not know, but it is obvious that he cannot have been strictly debarred from writing by his jailers. In prison, too, he made both friends and converts. We have seen that we owe the publication of a portion of his poems to the visit of a German knight. 5. The sonnets by Campanella translated in this volume might be arranged under four headings philosophical, political, prophetic, personal. The philosophical group throw light on Campanella's relation to his predecessors and his antagonism to the pseudo-Aristotelian scholasticism of the Middle Ages. They furthermore explain his conception of the universe as a complex animated organism, his conviction that true knowledge can only be gained by the interrogation of nature, his doctrine of human life and action, and his judgment of the age in which he lived. The political sonnets fall into two groups, those which discuss royalty, nobility, and the sovereignty of the people, and those which treat of the several European states. The prophetic sonnets seem to have been suggested by the misery and corruption of Italy, and express the poet's belief in the speedy triumph of right and reason. It is here, too, that his astrological opinions are most clearly manifested, for Campanella was far from having outgrown the belief in planetary influences. Indeed, his own metaphysical speculations, involving the principle of imminent vitality in the material universe, gave a new value to the dreams of the astrologers. Among the personal sonnets, may be placed those which refer immediately to his own sufferings in prison, to his friendships, and to the ideal of the philosophic character. I have thought it best, while indicating this fourfold division, to preserve the order adopted by Adami, since each of the reprints accessible to modern readers, both that of Orelli and that of Dancona, maintains the arrangement of the Aditio Princeps. 
Two sonnets of the prophetic group I have omitted, partly because they have no bearing on the world as it exists for us at present, and partly because they are too studiously obscure for profitable reproduction. As in the case of Michelangelo, so also in that of Campanella, I have left the canzoni untouched, except by way of illustration in the notes appended to my volume. They are important and voluminous enough to form a separate book, nor do they seem to me so well adapted as the sonnets for translation into English. To give reasons for my choice of certain readings in the case of either Michelangelo's or Campanella's text, to explain why I have sometimes preferred a strictly literal and sometimes a more paraphrastic rendering, or to set forth my views in detail regarding the compromises which are necessary in translation, and which must vary according to the exigencies of each successive problem offered by the original, would occupy too much space. Where I have thought it absolutely necessary, I have referred to such points in my notes. It is enough here to remark that the difficulties presented to the translator by Michelangelo and by Campanella are of different kinds. Both, indeed, pack their thoughts so closely that it is not easy to reproduce them without either awkwardness or sacrifice of matter. But while Campanella is difficult from the abruptness of his transitions and the violence of his phrases, Michelangelo has the obscurity of a writer whose thoughts exceed his power of expression, and who complicates the verbal form by his endeavor to project what cannot easily be said in verse. A little patience will generally make it clear what Campanella meant, except in cases where the text itself is corrupt. But it may sometimes be doubted whether Michelangelo could himself have done more than indicate the general drift of his thought, or have disengaged his own conception from the tangled skein of elliptical and ungrammatical sentences in which he has enveloped it. The form of Campanella's poetry, though often grotesque, is always clear. Michelangelo has left too many of his compositions in the same state as his marbles. Unfinished and colossal abbozzi which lack the final touches to make their outlines distinct. Under these circumstances, it can hardly happen that the translator should succeed in reproducing all the sharpness and vivacity of Campanella's style, or should wholly refrain from softening, simplifying, and prettifying Michelangelo in his attempt to produce an intelligible version. In both cases he is tempted to make his translation serve the purpose also of a commentary, and has to exercise caution and self-control, lest he impose a sense too narrow or too definite upon the original. So far as this was possible, I have adhered to the rhyming structure of my originals, feeling that this is a point of no small moment in translation. Yet when the choice lay between a sacrifice of metrical exactitude and a sacrifice of sense, I have not hesitated to prefer the former, especially in dealing with Campanella's quatrains. Michelangelo and Campanella follow different rules in their treatment of the triplets. Michelangelo allows himself three rhymes, while Campanella usually confines himself to two. My practice has been to study in each sonnet the cadence both of thought and diction, so as to satisfy an English ear, accustomed to the various forms of termination exemplified by Spencer, Milton, Wordsworth, and Rossetti. The sweetest, the most sublime, the least artificial, and the most artful sonnet writers in our language. The short titles attached to each sonnet are intended to help the eye, rather than to guide the understanding of the reader. Michelangelo and his editors supply no arguments or mottos for his poems, while those printed by Adami in his edition of Campanella are, like mine, meant obviously to serve as signposts to the student. It may savor of impudence to ticket and to label little masterpieces, each one of which, like all good poems, is a microcosm of very varied meanings. Yet I have some authority in modern times for this impertinence, and when it is acknowledged that the titles merely profess to guide the reader through a labyrinth of abstract and reflective compositions without attempting to supply him with a comprehensive argument or to dogmatize concerning the main drift of each poem, I trust that enough will have been said by way of self-defense against the charge of arrogance. The sonnet prefixed as a proem to the whole book is generally attributed to Giordano Bruno, in whose dialogue on the Eroici Furori it occurs. There seems, however, good reason to suppose that it was really written by Tanzillo, who recites it in that dialogue. Whoever may have been its author, it expresses in noble and impassioned verse the sense of danger, the audacity, and the exaltation of those pioneers of modern thought for whom philosophy was a voyage of discovery into untraveled regions. Its spirit is rather that of Campanella than of Michelangelo. Yet the elevation at which Michelangelo habitually lived in thought and feeling was so far above the plains of common life, that from the summit of his solitary watchtower he might have followed even such high flyers as Bruno or as Campanella in their Icarian excursions with the eyes of speculative interest. Davos Platz, November 1877 Proem The Philosophic Flight Poi che spiegate now that these wings to speed my wish ascend, the more I feel vast air beneath my feet, the more toward boundless air on pinions fleet, spurning the earth, soaring to heaven, I tend. Nor makes them stoop their flight, the direful end of Dedal's son. 
but upward still they beat. What life the while with my life can compete, though dead to earth at last I shall descend. My own heart's voice in the void air I hear, where wilt thou bear me, O rash man? Recall thy daring will, this boldness waits on fear. Dread not, I answer, that tremendous fall. Strike through the clouds, and smile when death is near, if death so glorious be our doom at all. End of proem. Section 1 of The Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella Translated by John Addington Simmons This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Michelangelo, Sonnets 1 through 15 1. On Dante Alighieri Dal ciel discese From heaven his spirit came, and robed in clay, the realms of justice and of mercy trod, then rose a living man to gaze on God, that he might make the truth as clear as day. For that pure star that brightened with his ray, the undeserving nest where I was born, the whole wide world would be a prize to scorn. None but his maker can do guerdon pay. I speak of Dante, whose high work remains, unknown, unhonored, by that thankless brood, who only to just men deny their wage. Were I but he, born for like lingering pains, against his exile coupled with his good, I'd gladly change the world's best heritage. 2. On Dante Alighieri Quante dir ne si de No tongue can tell of him what should be told, for on blind eyes his splendor shines too strong. T'were easier to blame those who wrought him wrong than sound his least praise with a mouth of gold. He to explore the place of pain was bold, then soared to God to teach our souls by song. The gates of heaven oped to bear his feet along. Against his just desire his country rolled. Thankless I call her, and to her own pain, the nurse of fell mischance, for sign take this, that ever to the best she deals more scorn, among a thousand proofs let one remain. Though ne'er was fortune more unjust than his, his equal or his better ne'er was born. 3. To Pope Julius the Second, Signor Severo e, my lord, if ever ancient saw spake sooth, hear this which saith, Who can, doth never will. Lo, thou hast lent thine ear to fables still, rewarding those who hate the name of truth. I am thy drudge, and have been from my youth, thine like the rays which the sun's circle fill. Yet of my dear time's waste thou thinkest no ill, the more I toil, the less I move thy ruth. Once t'was my hope to raise me by thy height, but tis the balance and the powerful sword of justice, not false echo, that we need. Heaven, as it seems, plants virtue and despite, here on the earth, if this be our reward, to seek for fruit on trees too dry to breed. 4. On Rome, in the pontificate of Julius the Second. Qua si fa elmi. Here helms and swords are made of chalices, the blood of Christ is sold so much the court. His cross and thorns are spears and shields, In short must be the time ere even his patience cease. Nay, let him come no more to raise the fees Of this foul sacrilege beyond report, For Rome still flays and sells him at the court, Where paths are closed to virtue's fair increase. Now were fit time for me to scrape a treasure, Seeing that work and gain are gone, While he who wears the robe is my Medusa still. God welcomes poverty perchance with pleasure, but of that better life what hope have we, when the blessed banner leads to naught but ill? 5. To Giovanni da Pistoia On the painting of the Sistine Chapel Io ho già fatto un gozzo I've grown a goiter by dwelling in this den, as cats from stagnant streams in Lombardy, or in what other land they have to be, which drives the belly close beneath the chin. My beard turns up to heaven, my nape falls in, Fixed on my spine, my breastbone visibly, grows like a harp, a rich embroidery, bedews my face from brush drops thick and thin. My loins into my paunch like levers grind, my buttock like a crupper bears my weight, my feet unguided wander to and fro. In front my skin grows loose and long, behind, by bending it becomes more taut and straight. 
Crosswise I strain me like a Syrian bow. Whence false and quaint, I know, must be the fruit of squinting brain and eye. For ill can aim the gun that bends awry. Come then, Giovanni, try, to succor my dead pictures and my fame, since foul I fare, and painting is my shame. 6. Invective against the people of Pistoia. I lo, vostra merce. I've gotten it, thanks to your courtesy, and I have read it twenty times or so. Thus much may your sharp snarling profit you, as food our flesh filled to satiety. After I left you I could plainly see how Cain was of your ancestors, I know. You do not shame his lineage, for lo, your brother's good still seems your injury. Envious you are, and proud, and foes to heaven, love of your neighbors still you loathe and hate, and only seek what must your ruin be. If to Pistoia Dante's curse was given, bear that in mind, enough. But if you prate praises of Florence, tis to wheedle me. A priceless jewel she, doubtless, but this you cannot understand, for pygmy virtue grasps not aught so grand. 7. To Luigi del Riccio Nel dolce d'una It happens that the sweet unfathomed sea of seeming courtesy sometimes doth hide offence to life and honour, this descried, I hold less dear the health restored to me. He who lends wings of hope, while secretly he spreads a traitorous snare by the wayside, hath dulled the flame of love, and mortified friendship where friendship burns most fervently. Keep then, my dear Luigi, clear and pure, that ancient love to which my life I owe, that neither wind nor storm its calm may mar, for wrath and pain are gratitude obscure. And if the truest truth of love I know, one pang outweighs a thousand pleasures far. 8. To Luigi del Riccio, after the death of Cecchino Bracci. Appena prima. Scarce had I seen for the first time his eyes, which to your living eyes were life and light, when closed at last in death's injurious night, he opened them on God and paradise. I know it, and I weep, too late made wise. Yet was the fault not mine, for death's fell spite robbed my desire of that supreme delight, which in your better memory never dies. Therefore, Luigi, if the task be mine, to make unique Cecchino smile and stone, forever, now that earth hath made him dim, if the beloved within the lover shine, since art without him cannot work alone, you must, I carve, to tell the world of him. 9. Thanks for a gift. Al zucchero alla mula. The sugar candles in the saddled mule, together with your cask of malvoisie, so far exceed all my necessity, that Michael and not I my debt must rule. In such a glassy calm the breezes fool my sinking sails, so that amid the sea my bark hath missed her way, and seems to be a wisp of straw whirled on a weltering pool, to yield the gift for gift and grace for grace, for food and drink and carriage to and fro, for all my need in every time and place, O oh, my dear Lord! Matched with the much I owe, all that I am were no real recompense. Paying a debt is not munificence. 10. To Gandolfo Porrino. On his mistress Faustina Mancina. La nuova alta beltà. That new transcendent fair who seems to be peerless in heaven as in the world of woe, the common folk, too blind her worth to know, and worship, called her left arm wantonly was made full well i know for only thee nor could i carve or paint the glorious show of that fair face to life thou needs must go to gain the favour thou dost crave of me if like the sun each star of heaven outshining she conquers and outsoars our soaring thought this bids thee rate her worth at its real price therefore to satisfy thy ceaseless pining once more in heaven hath god her beauty wrought god and not i can people paradise 11. To Giorgio Vasari. On the Lives of the Painters. Secondo Stile. With pencil and with palette hitherto, you made your art high nature's paragon. Nay more, from nature her own prize you won, making what she made fair more fair to view. Now that your learned hand, with labor new, of pen and ink a worthier work hath done, what erst you lacked, what still remained her own, the power of giving life, is gained for you. If men in any age with nature vied in beauteous workmanship, they had to yield, when to the fated end years brought their name. You, re-illuming memories that died, 
in spite of time and nature have revealed, for them and for yourself, eternal fame. 12. To Vittoria Colonna. A matchless courtesy. Felice Spirito. Blessed spirit, who with loving tenderness quickenest my heart so old and near to die, who mid thy joys on me dost bend an eye, though many nobler men around thee press. As thou wert erewhile wont my sight to bless, so to console my mind thou now dost fly. Hope, therefore, stills the pangs of memory, which coupled with desire my soul distress. So finding in thee grace to plead for me, thy thoughts for me sunk in so sad a case, he who now writes returns thee thanks for these. Lo, it were foul and monstrous usury to send the ugliest paintings in the place of thy fair spirit's living fantasies. 13. To Vittoria Colonna. Brazen Gifts for Golden. Per esser manco almen. Seeking at least to be not all unfit, for thy sublime and boundless courtesy, my lowly thoughts at first were fain to try what they could yield for grace so infinite. But now I know my unassisted wit is all too weak to make me soar so high, for pardon, lady, for this fault I cry, and wiser still I grow remembering it. Yea, well I see what folly twere to think, that largesse dropped from thee like dews from heaven, could e'er be paid by work so frail as mine. To nothingness my art and talent sink. He fails who from his mortal stores hath given a thousandfold to match one gift divine. 14. First Reading to Vittoria Colonna, the model and the statue. Da che concetto? When divine art conceives a form and face, she bids the craftsman for his first essay to shape a simple model in mere clay. This is the earliest birth of art's embrace. From the live marble in the second place, his mallet brings into the light of day a thing so beautiful that who can say when time shall conquer that immortal grace? Thus my own model I was born to be the model of that nobler self, whereto, schooled by your pity, lady, I shall grow. Each overplus and each deficiency you will make good. What penance, then, is due for my fierce heat chastened and taught by you? 14. Second Reading To Vittoria Colonna The Model and the Statue Se ben concetto When that which is divine in us doth try to shape a face, both brain and hand unite to give, from a mere model frail and slight, life to the stone by art's free energy thus too before the painter dares to ply paintbrush or canvas he is wont to write sketches on scraps of paper and invite wise minds to judge his figured history so born a model rude and mean to be of my poor self i gain a nobler birth lady from you you fountain of all worth each overplus and each deficiency you will make good what penance then is due for my fierce heat chastened and taught by you 15. The Lover and the Sculptor Non all'ottimo artista The best of artists hath no thought to show which the rough stone in its superfluous shell doth not include, to break the marble spell. Is all the hand that serves the brain can do? The ill I shun, the good I seek, even so, in thee, fair lady, proud, ineffable, lies hidden, but the art I wield so well works adverse to my wish, and lays me low. Therefore not love, nor thy transcendent face, nor cruelty, nor fortune, nor disdain, cause my mischance, nor fate, nor destiny, since in thy heart thou carriest death and grace, and close together, and my worthless brain can draw forth only death to feed on me. End of section 1 Section 2 of The Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella Translated by John Addington Simmons This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2 Michelangelo, Sonnets 16 through 30 16. Love and Art Si come nella penna as pen and ink alike serve him who sings, in high or low or intermediate style, as the same stone hath shapes both rich and vile to match the fancies that each master brings, so, my loved lord, within thy bosom springs pride mixed with meekness and kind thoughts that smile. 
whence I draw not my sad self to beguile, but what my face shows, dark imaginings. He who for seed sows sorrow, tears, and sighs. The dews that fall from heaven, though pure and clear, from different germs take diverse qualities, must needs reap grief and garner weeping eyes, and he who looks on beauty with sad cheer gains doubtful hope and certain miseries. 17. The Artist and His Work Come sur don la poix. How can that be, lady, which all men learn by long experience? Shapes that seem alive, wrought in hard mountain marble, will survive their maker, whom the years to dust return. Thus, to effect, cause yields. Art hath her turn and triumphs over nature. I, who strive with sculpture, know this well. Her wonders live, in spite of time and death, those tyrants stern. So I can give long life to both of us, in either way, by color or by stone, making the semblance of thy face and mine. Centuries hence, when both are buried thus, thy beauty and my sadness shall be shown. And men shall say, For her t'was wise to pine. 18. Beauty and the Artist Al cor di Zolfo A heart of flaming sulphur, flesh of tow, Bones of dry wood, a soul without a guide to curb the fiery will, the ruffling pride of fierce desires that from the passions flow, a sightless mind that weak and lame doth go, mid snares and pitfalls scattered far and wide. What wonder if the first chance brand applied to fuel massed like this should make it glow? Add beauteous art, which, brought with us from heaven, will conquer nature, so divine a power belongs to him who strives with every nerve. If I was made for art, from childhood given, a prey for burning beauty to devour, I blame the mistress I was born to serve. 19. The Amulet of Love Io mi son caro assai più. Far more than I was wont myself I prize. With you within my heart I rise and rate, just as a gem engraved with delicate devices o'er the uncut stone doth rise, or as a painted sheet exceeds in price each leaf left pure and in its virgin state. Such then am I, since I was consecrate, to be the mark for arrows from your eyes. Stamped with your seal, I'm safe where'er I go, like one who carries charms or coat of mail, against all dangers that his life assail, nor fire nor water now may work me woe. Sight to the blind I can restore by you, heal every wound and every loss renew. 20. The Garland and the Girdle Quanta si gode lieta What joy hath yon glad wreath of flowers, that is, around her golden hair so deftly twined, each blossom pressing forward from behind, as though to be the first her brows to kiss? The live-long day her dress hath perfect bliss, That now reveals her breast, now seems to bind. And that fair woven net of gold refined Rests on her cheek and throat in happiness. Yet still more blissful seems to me the band Gilt at the tips, so sweetly doth it ring And clasp the bosom that it serves to lace. Yea, and the belt to such as understand, Bound round her waist, saith, Here I'd ever cling. What would my arms do in that girdle's place? 21. The Silkworm D'altrui pietoso Kind to the world, but to itself unkind, a worm is born that, dying noiselessly, despoils itself to clothe fair limbs, and be in its true worth by death alone divined. Oh, would that I might die for her to find raiment in my outworn mortality, that, changing like the snake, I might be free to cast the sloth wherein I dwell confined. Nay, were it mine, that shaggy fleece that stays, woven and wrought into a vestment fair, around her beauteous bosom in such bliss, all through the day she'd clasp me. Would I were the shoes that bear her burden. When the ways were wet with rain, her feet I then should kiss. 22. Waiting in Faith Se no volto per gli occhi if through the eyes the heart speaks clear and true, I have no stronger sureties than these eyes for my pure love. Prithee let them suffice, Lord of my soul, 
pity to gain from you. More tenderly perchance than is my due, your spirit sees into my heart, where rise the flames of holy worship, nor denies the grace reserved for those who humbly sue. O blessed day, when you at last are mine! Let time stand still, and let noon's chariot stay, fixed be that moment on the dial of heaven, that I may clasp and keep, by grace divine, clasp in these yearning arms, and keep for I, my heart's loved Lord, to me desertless given. 23. Flesh and Spirit. Ben posson yoki. Well may these eyes of mine, both near and far, behold the beams that from thy beauty flow. But, lady, feet must halt where sight may go. We see, but cannot climb to clasp a star. The pure ethereal soul surmounts that bar of flesh and soars to where thy splendors glow. Free through the eyes, while prisoned here below, though fired with fervent love, our bodies are. Clogged with mortality and wingless, we cannot pursue an angel in her flight. Only to gaze exhausts our utmost might. Yet, if but heaven like earth incline to thee, let my whole body be one eye to see, that not one part of me may miss thy sight. 24. The Doom of Beauty, Spirito Bennato. Choice soul in whom, as in a glass, we see, mirrored in thy pure form and delicate, what beauties heaven and nature can create, the paragon of all their works to be. Fair soul, in whom love, pity, piety, have found a home, as from thy outward state we clearly read, and are so rare and great, that they adorn none other like to thee. Love takes me captive, beauty binds my soul, pity and mercy with their gentle eyes wake in my heart a hope that cannot cheat. What law, what destiny, what fell control, what cruelty, or late or soon, denies that death should spare perfection so complete? 25. The Transfiguration of Beauty, A Dialogue with Love Dimmi di grazia, amor. Nay, prithee tell me, love, when I behold my lady, do mine eyes her beauty see in truth, or dwells that loveliness in me, which multiplies her grace a thousandfold, Thou needs must know, for thou with her of old comest to stir my soul's tranquillity. Yet would I not seek one sigh less, or be by loss of that loved flame more simply cold. The beauty thou discernest all is hers, but grows in radiance as it soars on high, through mortal eyes unto the soul above. Tis there transfigured, for the soul confers on what she holds her own divinity. In this transfigured beauty wins thy love. 26. Joy may kill. Non men gran grazia, donna. Too much good luck, no less than misery, may kill a man condemned to mortal pain, if, lost to hope and chilled in every vein, a sudden pardon comes to set him free. Thus thy unwanted kindness shown to me, amid the gloom where only sad thoughts reign, with too much rapture bringing light again, threatens my life more than that agony. Good news and bad may bear the self-same knife, and death may follow both upon their flight. For hearts that shrink or swell alike will break. Let then thy beauty, to preserve my life, temper the source of this supreme delight, lest joy so poignant slay a soul so weak. 27. No escape from love. Non posso altra figura. I cannot by the utmost flight of thought conceive another form of air or clay wherewith against thy beauty to array my wounded heart in armor fancy wrought. For, lacking thee, so low my state is brought, that love hath stolen all my strength away, whence, when I fain would have my griefs, they weigh, with double sorrow, and I sink to naught. Thus all in vain my soul, to scape thee, flies, for ever faster flies her beauteous foe, from the swift-footed feebly run the slow. Yet with his hands love wipes my weeping eyes, saying, This toil will end in happy cheer. What costs the heart so much must needs be dear. 28. The Heavenly Birth of Love and Beauty. La vita del mio amor. This heart of flesh feeds not with life my love. The love wherewith I love thee hath no heart, nor harbors it in any mortal part where erring thought or ill desire may move. When first love sent our souls from God above, he fashioned me to see thee as thou art, pure light, and thus I find God's counterpart in thy fair face, and feel the sting thereof. 
as heat from fire, from loveliness divine, the mind that worships what recalls the sun, from whence she sprang, can be divided never. And since thine eyes all paradise enshrine, burning unto those orbs of light I run, there where I loved thee first to dwell forever. 29. Love's Dilemma I mi credetti I deemed upon that day when first I knew so many peerless beauties blent in one, that, like an eagle gazing on the sun, mine eyes might fix on the least part of you. That dream hath vanished, and my hope is flown, for he who fain a seraph would pursue wingless, hath cast words to the winds, and dew on stones, engaged God's reason with his own. If then my heart cannot endure the blaze of beauties infinite that blind these eyes, nor yet can bear to be from you divided, what fate is mine? Who guides or guards my ways, seeing my soul so lost and ill betided, burns in your presence, in your absence dies? 30. To Tommaso de Cavalieri. Love the light-giver. Ve gioco be vostri occhi. With your fair eyes a charming light I see, for which my own blind eyes would peer in vain. Stayed by your feet the burden I sustain, which my lame feet find all too strong for me, wingless upon your pinions forth I fly. Heavenward your spirit stirreth me to strain, and as you will I blush and blanch again, freeze in the sun, burn neath a frosty sky, your will includes and is the lord of mine. Life to my thoughts within your heart is given. My words begin to breathe upon your breath. Like to the moon I am that cannot shine, alone, for lo, our eyes see not in heaven, save what the living sun illumineth. End of section 2section three of the sonnets of michelangelo buonarotti and tommaso campanella translated by john addington simmons this librivox recording is in the public domain section three michelangelo sonnets thirty one to forty five thirty one to tommaso de cavalieri love's lordship a che più de bio why should I seek to ease intense desire with still more tears and windy words of grief? When heaven, or late or soon, sends no relief to souls whom love hath robed around with fire, why need my aching heart to death aspire when all must die? Nay, death beyond belief unto these eyes would be both sweet and brief, since in my sum of woes all joys expire. Therefore, because I cannot shun the blow I rather seek, say who must roll my breast, gliding between her gladness and her woe? If only chains and bands can make me blessed, no marvel if alone and bare I go, an armed knight's captive and slave confessed. 32. Love's Expostulation Sunt casto amor If love be chaste, if virtue conquer ill, if fortune bind both lovers in one bond, if either at the other's grief despond, if both be governed by one life, one will, if in two bodies one soul triumph still, raising the twain from earth to heaven beyond, if love with one blow and one golden wand have power both smitten breast to pierce and thrill, if each the other love himself foregoing, with such delight, such savour, and so well, that both to one sole end their wills combine. If thousands of these thoughts, all thought outgoing, fail the least part of their firm love to tell, say, can mere angry spite this knot untwine? 33. First reading. A prayer to nature. Amor redivivus. Perché tuo gran bellezze. That thy great beauty on our earth may be shrined in a lady softer and more kind, I call on nature to collect and bind, all those delights the slow years steal from thee, and save them to restore the radiancy of thy bright face in some fair form designed by heaven. And may love ever bear in mind to mould her heart of grace and courtesy. I call on nature, too, to keep my sighs, my scattered tears to take and recombine, and give to him who loves that fair again. More happy he, perchance, shall move those eyes to mercy by the griefs wherewith I pine, nor lose the kindness that from me is ta'en. 33. Second reading. A prayer to nature. Amor redivivus. 
sol perché tue bellezze. If only that thy beauties here may be, deathless through time that rends the wreaths he twined, I trust that nature will collect and bind all those delights the slow years steal from thee, and keep them for a birth more happily, born under better auspices, refined, into a heavenly form of nobler mind, endowered with all thine angel purity. Ah, me! And may heaven also keep my sighs, my scattered tears preserve and reunite, and give to him who loves that fair again. More happy he perchance shall move those eyes to mercy by the griefs my manhood blight, nor lose the kindness that from me is ta'en. 34. Love's Furnace Si amico Alfredo Sasso So friendly is the fire to flinty stone, that, struck therefrom and kindled to a blaze, it burns the stone, and from the ash doth raise, what lives thenceforward binding stones in one. Kiln hardened, this resists both frost and sun, acquiring higher worth for endless days, as the purged soul from hell returns with praise, amid the heavenly host to take her throne. E'en so the fire struck from my soul that lay close hidden in my heart may temper me, till burned and slaked to better life I rise. If, made mere smoke and dust, I live to-day, fire-hardened I shall live eternally. Such gold, not iron, my spirit strikes and tries. 35. Love's Paradoxes Sento d'un foco. Far off with fire I feel a cold face lit, That makes me burn, the while itself doth freeze. Two fragile arms enchain me, Which with ease, unmoved themselves, Can move weights infinite. A soul none knows but I, most exquisite, That, deathless, deals me death, my spirit sees. I meet with one who, free, my heart doth seize, And who alone can cheer, hath tortured it. How can it be that from one face like thine my own should feel effects so contrary, since ill comes not from things devoid of ill? That loveliness, perchance, doth make me pine, even as the sun whose fiery beams we see inflames the world while he is temperate still. 36. Love Misinterpreted Se l'immortal desio If the undying thirst that purifies our mortal thoughts could draw mine to the day, Perchance the Lord, who now holds cruel sway in love's high house, would prove more kindly wise. But since the laws of heaven immortalize our souls, and doom our flesh to swift decay, tongue cannot tell how fair, how pure as day, is the soul's thirst that far beyond it lies. How then, ah, woe is me, shall that chaste fire which burns the heart within me be made known, if sense finds only sense in what it sees? All my fair hours are turned to miseries, with my loved Lord, who minds but lies alone. For, truth to tell, who trusts not is a liar. 37. Perhaps to Vittoria Colonna. Love's servitude. Salcun legato e pur. He who is bound by some great benefit, as to be raised from death to life again, how shall he recompense that gift, or gain freedom from servitude so infinite? Yet, if t'were possible to pay the debt, He'd lose that kindness which we entertain for those who serve us well, since it is plain that kindness needs some boon to quicken it. Wherefore, O lady, to maintain thy grace so far above my fortune, what I bring, is rather thanklessness than courtesy. For, if both met as equals face to face, she whom I love could not be called my king. There is no lordship in equality. 38. Love's Vain Expense Rendete a occhi miei. Give back unto mine eyes, ye fount and rill, those streams not yours that are so full and strong, that swell your springs and roll your waves along with force unwanted in your native hill. And thou, dense air, weighed with my sighs so chill that hidest heaven's own light thick mists among. Give back those sighs to my sad heart, nor wrong my visual ray with thy dark face of ill. Let earth give back the footprints that I wore, that the bare grass I spoiled may sprout again, and echo, now grown deaf, my cries return. Loved eyes, unto mine eyes those looks restore, and let me woo another not in vain, since how to please thee I shall never learn. 39. Love's Argument with Reason La ragion meco si lamenta Reason laments and grieves full sore with me, the while I hope by loving to be blessed. 
with precepts sound and true philosophy. My shame she quickens thus within my breast. What else but death will that sun deal to thee, nor like the phoenix in her flaming nest? Yet naught avails this wise morality, no hand can save a suicide confessed. I know my doom, the truth I apprehend. But on the other side my traitorous heart slays me whene'er to wisdom's words I bend. Between two deaths my lady stands apart. This death I dread, that none can comprehend. In this suspense body and soul must part. 40. First reading. Love's Lodestone. No so se la desiata lucha. I know not if it be the longed-for light of her first maker which the spirit feels, or if a time-old memory reveals some other beauty for the heart's delight, or fame or dreams beget that vision bright, sweet to thine eyes, which through the bosom steals, leaving I know not what wounds and heals, and now perchance hath made me weep outright. Be this what this may be, tis this I seek, nor guide have I, nor know I where to find that burning fire, yet some one seems to lead. This, since I saw thee, lady, makes me weak. A bitter sweet sways here and there my mind, and sure I am thine eyes this mischief breed. Forty, second reading, Love's Lodestone. Non so se se l'imaginata luce. I know not if it be the fancied light which every man, or more or less, doth feel, or if the mind and memory reveal some other beauty for the heart's delight, or if within the soul the vision bright of her celestial home once more doth steal, drawing our better thoughts with pure appeal to the true good above all mortal sight. This light I long for, and unguided seek, this fire that burns my heart I cannot find, nor know the way, though someone seems to lead. This, since I saw thee, lady, makes me weak, a bitter sweet sways here and there my mind, and sure I am, thine eyes this mischief breed. 41. Light and Darkness. Colui che fece. He who ordained, when first the world began, time, that was not before creation's hour, divided it, and gave the sun's high power to rule the one, the moon, the other span. Thence fate and changeful chance and fortune's ban did in one moment down on mortals shower. To me they portioned darkness for a dower. Dark hath my lot been, since I was a man. Myself am ever mine own counterfeit. And as deep night grows still more dim and dun, so still of more misdoing must I rue. Meanwhile this solace to my soul is sweet, that my black night doth make more clear the sun, which at your birth was given to wait on you. 42. Sacred Night. Ogni vancuso. All hollow vaults and dungeons sealed from sight, all caverns circumscribed with roof and wall defend dark night, though noon around her fall from the fierce play of solar daybeams bright. But if she be assailed by fire or light, her powers divine are not, they tremble all, before things far more vile and trivial. Even a glow-worm can confound their might, the earth that lies bare to the sun and breeds a thousand germs that burgeon and decay. This earth is wounded by the plowman's share. But only darkness serves for human seeds, night therefore is more sacred far than day since man excels all fruits, however fair. 48. The Impeachment of Night Perché Febo non torce? What time bright Phoebus doth not stretch and bend his shining arms around this tearing sphere? The people call that season dark and drear, night, for the cause they do not comprehend. So weak is night that if our hand extend a glimmering torch her shadows disappear, leaving her dead, like frailest gossamer, Tinder and steel her mantle rive and rend. Nay, if this night be anything at all, sure she is daughter of the sun and earth. This holds, the other spreads that shadowy pall. How be it they err who praise this gloomy birth, so frail and desolate and void of mirth, that one poor firefly can her might appall. 44. The Defense of Night O noto dolce tempo! O night! O oh, sweet though sombre span of time! All things find rest upon their journey's end. Whoso hath praised thee, well doth apprehend. And whoso honours thee, hath wisdom's prime. Our cares thou canst to quietude sublime. For dews and darkness are of peace the friend. Often by thee, in dreams upborne, I wend, From earth to heaven, where yet I hope to climb. Thou shade of death, 
through whom the soul at length shuns pain and sadness hostile to the heart, whom mourners find their last and sure relief. Thou dost restore our suffering flesh to strength, driest our tears, assuagest every smart, purging the spirits of the pure from grief. 45. Love feeds the flame of age. Quando servo il Signor. When masters bind a slave with cruel chain, and keep him hope forlorn and bondage pent, use tames his temper to imprisonment, and hardly would he fain be free again. Use curbs the snake and tiger, and doth train fierce woodland lions to bear chastisement, and the young artist, all with toil forspent, by constant use a giant's strength doth gain. But with the force of flame it is not so, for while fire sucks the sap of the green wood, it warms a frore old man and makes him grow, with such fine heat of youth and lustihood, filling his heart and teaching it to glow, that love enfolds him with beatitude. If, then, in playful mood, he sport and jest, old age need no man blame, for loving things divine implies no shame. The soul that knows her aim sins not by loving God's own counterfeit. Do measure kept and bounds and order meet. End of section 3《セクション4 of the Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella, translated by John Addington Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《セクション4 Michelangelo, Sonnets 46 to 60. 46. Love's flame doth feed on age. Se da primani. If some mild heat of love in youth confessed burns a fresh heart with swift consuming fire, what will the force be of a flame more dire shut up within an old man's cindery breast? If the mere lapse of lengthening years hath pressed so sorely that life, strength, and vigor tire, how shall he fare who must ere long expire when to old age is added love's unrest? Weak as myself, he will be whirled away like dust by winds kind in their cruelty, robbing the loathly worm of its last prey. A little flame consumed and fed on me in my green age, now that the wood is dry, what hope against this fire more fierce have I? 47. Beauty's Intolerable Splendor So foco alla bellezza If but the fire that lightens in thine eyes were equal with their beauty, all the snow and frost of all the world would melt and glow, like brands that blaze beneath fierce tropic skies. But heaven and mercy to our miseries dulls and divides the fiery beams that flow from thy great loveliness, that we may go, through this stern mortal life in tranquil wise. Thus beauty burns not with consuming rage, for so much only of the heavenly light inflames our love as finds a fervent heart. This is my case, lady, in sad old age, if seeing thee I do not die outright, tis that I feel thy beauty but in part. 48. Love's Evening se troppo indugio. What though long waiting wins more happiness than petulant desire is wont to gain? My luck in latest age hath brought me pain, thinking how brief must be an old man's bliss. Heaven, if it heed our lives, can hardly bless this fire of love when frosts are wont to rain. For so I love thee, lady, and my strain of tears through age exceeds in tenderness. Yet peradventure, though my day is done, Though nearly past the setting mid-thick cloud, and frozen exhalations, sinks my sun. If love to only midday be allowed, and I an old man in my evening burn, you, lady, still my night to noon may turn. 49. Love's Excuse Dal dolce pianto From happy tears to woeful smiles, from peace eternal to a brief and hollow truce, how have I fallen! When tis truth we lose, sense triumphs o'er all adverse impulses. I know not if my heart bred this disease, that still more pleasing grows with growing use, or else thy face, thine eyes, which stole the hues and fires of paradise, less fair than these. Thy beauty is no mortal thing, t'was sent from heaven on high to make our earth divine. Wherefore, though wasting, burning, I'm content. For in thy sight what could I do but pine, if God himself thus rules my destiny? Who, when I die, can lay the blame on thee? 50. In Love's Own Time 
si avessi creduto. Had I but earlier known that from the eyes of that bright soul that fires me like the sun, I might have drawn new strength my race to run, burning as burns the phoenix ere it dies, even as the stag or lynx or leopard flies, to seek his pleasure and his pain to shun, each word, each smile of her would I have won, flying where now sad age all flight denies. Yet why complain, for even now I find, in that glad angel's face so full of rest, health and content, heart's ease and peace of mind. Perchance I might have been less simply blessed, finding her sooner, if tis age alone that lets me soar with her to seek God's throne. 51. First Reading. Love in Youth and Age. Tornami al tempo. Bring back the time when blind desire ran free, with bit and rein too loose to curb his flight. Give back the buried face, once angel bright, that hides in earth all comely things from me. Bring back those journeys tanned so toilsomely, so toilsome slow to one whose hairs are white, those tears and flames that in one breast unite, if thou wilt once more take thy fill of me. Yet, love, suppose it true that thou dost thrive, only on bitter honey-dews of tears, small profit hast thou of a weak old man. My soul that toward the other shore doth strive, wards off thy darts with shafts of holier fears, and fire feeds ill on brands no breath can fan. 51. Second Reading. Love in Youth and Age. Tornami al tempo. Bring back the time when glad desire ran free, with bit and rein too loose to curb his flight, the tears and flames that in one breast unite, if thou art fain once more to conquer me. Bring back those journeys ta'en so toilsomely, so toilsome slow to him whose hairs are white. Give back the buried face, once angel bright, that taxed all nature's art and industry. O oh, love, an old man finds it hard to chase thy flying pinions. Thou hast left thy nest. Nor is my heart as light as heretofore. Put thy gold arrows to the string once more. Then if death hear my prayer and grant me grace, my grief I shall forget, again made blessed. 52. Celestial Love. Nun vider gli occhi miei. I saw no mortal beauty with these eyes, when perfect peace in thy fair eyes I found. But far within, where all is holy ground, my soul felt love, her comrade of the skies. For she was born with God in paradise, else should we still to transient loves be bound. But, finding these so false, we pass beyond, unto the love of loves that never dies. Nay, things that die cannot assuage the thirst of souls undying, nor eternity serves time, where all must fade that flourisheth. Sense is not love, but lawlessness accursed. This kills the soul, while thy love lifts on high, our friends on earth, higher in heaven through death. 53. Celestial and Earthly Love Non è sempre di colpa Love is not always harsh and deadly sin. If it be love of loveliness divine, it leaves the heart all soft and infantine, for rays of God's own grace to enter in. Love fits the soul with wings, and bids her win, her flight aloft, nor air to earth decline. Tis the first step that leads her to the shrine of him who slakes the thirst that burns within. The love of that whereof I speak ascends. Woman is different far, the love of her, but ill befits a heart all manly wise. The one love soars, the other downward tends. The soul lights this, while that the senses stir, and still his arrow at base quarry flies. 54. Love lifts to God. Vejo nel tuo bel viso. From thy fair face I learn, O my loved Lord, that which no mortal tongue can rightly say, the soul imprisoned in her house of clay, holpen by thee to God hath often soared. And though the vulgar, vain, malignant horde attribute what their grosser wills obey, yet shall this fervent homage that I pay, this love, this faith, pure joys for us afford. Lo, all the lovely things we find on earth resemble for the soul that rightly sees that source of bliss divine which gave us birth. Nor have we first fruits or remembrances of heaven elsewhere. Thus, loving loyally, I rise to God and make death sweet by thee. 55. Love's Entreaty Tu sa che io so, signor mia. Thou knowest, love, I know that thou dost know, that I am here more near to thee to be, and knowest that I know thou knowest me. What means it then that we are sundered so, if they are true, these hopes that from thee flow? if it is real, this sweet expectancy. 
break down the wall that stands twixt me and thee, for pain and prison pent hath double woe. Because in thee I love, O my loved Lord, what thou best lovest, be not therefore stern. Souls burn for souls, spirits to spirits cry. I seek the splendor in thy fair face stored, yet living man that beauty scarce can learn, and he who fain would find it first must die. 56. First reading. Heaven-born beauty. Per ritornar la. As one who will reseek her home of light, thy form immortal to this prison-house, descended, like an angel piteous, to heal all hearts and make the whole world bright. Tis this that thralls my soul in love's delight, not thy clear face of beauty glorious, for he who harbors virtue still will choose to love what neither years nor death can blight. So fares it ever with things high and rare, wrought in the sweat of nature, heaven above showers on their birth the blessings of her prime nor hath god deigned to show himself elsewhere more clearly than in human forms sublime which since they image him alone i love fifty six second reading heaven-born beauty venne non so ben donde it came i know not whence from far above that clear immortal flame that still doth rise within thy sacred breast and fills the skies and heals all hearts and adds to heaven new love this burns me this in the pure light thereof, not thy fair face, thy sweet untroubled eyes. For love that is not love for aught that dies, dwells in the soul where no base passions move. If then such loveliness upon its own should graft new beauties in a mortal birth, the sheath bespeaks the shining blade within. To gain our love, God hath not clearer shown himself elsewhere. Thus heaven doth vie with earth, to make thee worthy worship without sin. 57. First Reading. Carnal and Spiritual Love. Passa per gli occhi. Swift through the eyes, unto the heart within, all lovely forms that thrall our spirits stray. So smooth and broad and open is the way that thousands and not hundreds enter in. Burdened with scruples and weighed down with sin, these mortal beauties fill me with dismay. Nor find I one that doth not strive to stay my soul on transient joy, or lets me win the heaven I yearn for, Lo, when erring love, who fills the world, howsoe'er his power we shun, else were the world a grave and we undone, assails the soul, if grace refuse to fan our purged desires and make them soar above, what grief it were to have been born a man. 57. Second Reading. Carnal and Spiritual Love. Passa per gli occhi. Swift through the eyes, unto the heart within, all lovely forms that thrall our spirit stray, so smooth and broad and open is the way that thousands and not hundreds enter in of every age and sex whence i begin burdened with griefs but more with dull dismay to fear nor find mid all their bright array one that with full content my heart may win if mortal beauty be the food of love it came not with the soul from heaven and thus that love itself must be a mortal fire but if love reach to nobler hopes above thy love shall scorn me not nor dread desire that seeks a carnal prey assailing us. 58. Love and Death Onior que lido mio Whene'er the idol of these eyes appears, unto my musing heart so weak and strong, death comes between her and my soul ere long, chasing her thence with troops of gathering fears. Not less this violence my spirit cheers, with better hope than if she had no wrong while love invincible arrays the throng of dauntless thoughts and thus harangues his peers but once he argues can a mortal die but once be born and he who dies of fire what shall he gain if erst he dwelt with me that burning love whereby the soul flies free doth lure each fervent spirit to aspire like gold refined in flame to god on high fifty nine love is a refiner's fire non più che foco il fabbro it is with fire the blacksmiths iron subdue unto fair form the image of their thought nor without fire hath any artist wrought gold to its utmost purity of hue nay nor the unmatched phoenix lives anew unless she burn if then i am distraught by fire i may to better life be brought like those whom death restores nor years undo the fire whereof i speak is my great cheer such power it hath to renovate and raise me who was almost numbered with the dead and since by nature fire doth find its sphere soaring aloft and i am all ablaze 
heavenward with it my flight must needs be sped. 60. First reading. Love's Justification. Ben puo talor com mio. Sometimes my love I dare to entertain, with soaring hopes not over credulous, since if all human loves were impious, unto what end did God the world ordain? For loving thee, what license is more plain than that I praise thereby the glorious source of all joys divine that comforts us, in thee, and with chaste fires our souls sustain? False hope belongs unto that love alone, which with declining beauty wanes and dies, and, like the face it worships, fades away. That hope is true, which the pure heart hath known, which alters not with time or death's decay, yielding on earth, earnest of paradise. Sixty, second reading, Love's Justification, Ben puo talor cocasto. It must be right sometimes to entertain chaste love with hope not over-credulous, since if all human loves were impious, unto what end did God the world ordain? If I love thee and bend beneath thy reign, tis for the sake of beauty glorious, which in thine eyes divine is stored for us, and drives all evil thought from its domain. That is not love whose tyranny we own, in loveliness that every moment dies, which, like the face at worship, fades away. True love is that which the pure heart hath known, which alters not with time or death's decay, yielding on earth earnest of paradise. End of section 4「Section 5 of The Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella, translated by John Addington Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5. Michelangelo, Sonnets 61 to 77. 61. After the death of Vittoria Colonna, irreparable loss, sel mia rozzo martello. When my rude hammer to the stubborn stone gives human shape, now that, now this, at will, following his hand who wields and guides it still, it moves upon another's feet alone. But that which dwells in heaven the world doth fill, with beauty by pure motions of its own, and since tools fashion tools, which else were none, its life makes all that lives with living skill. Now, for that every stroke excels the more, the higher at the forge it doth ascend, her soul that fashioned mine hath sought the skies. Wherefore, unfinished, I must meet my end. If God, the great artificer, denies that aid which was unique on earth before. 62. After the death of Vittoria Colonna. Love's triumph over death. Quan del ministro de suspir. When she who was the source of all my sighs fled from the world, herself my straining sight, Nature who gave us that unique delight was sunk in shame, and we had weeping eyes. Yet shall not vauntful death enjoy this prize, this son of sons, which then he veiled in night. For love hath triumphed, lifting up her light, on earth and mid the saints and paradise. What though remorseless and impiteous doom deemed that the music of her deeds would die, and that her splendor would be sunk in gloom, the poet's page exalts her to the sky, with life more living in the lifeless tomb, and death translates her soul to reign on high. 63. After the death of Vittoria Colonna. After sunset. Be mi dove. Well might I in those days so fortunate what time the sun lightened my path above, have soared from earth to heaven, raised by her love, who winged my laboring soul and sweetened fate. That sun hath set, and I with hope elate, who deemed that those bright days would never move, find that my thankless soul, deprived thereof, declines to death, while heaven still bars the gate. Love lent me wings, my path was like a stair, a lamp unto my feet, that sun was given, and death was safety, and great joy to find. But dying now, I shall not climb to heaven, nor can mere memory cheer my heart's despair. What help remains when hope is left behind? 64. After the death of Vittoria Colonna. A wasted brand. Qual maraviglia è? If, being near the fire, I burned with it, now that its flame is quenched and doth not show, what wonder if I waste within and glow, dwindling away to cinders bit by bit? 
while still it burned i saw so brightly lit that splendor whence i drew my grievous woe that from its sight alone could pleasure flow and death and torment both seemed exquisite but now that heaven hath robbed me of the blaze of that great fire which burned and nourished me a coal that smoulders neath the ash am i unless love furnish wood fresh flames to raise i shall expire with not one spark to see so quickly into embers do i die sixty five to giorgio vasari on the brink of death giunto e già now hath my life across a stormy sea like a frail bark reached that wide port where all are bidden ere the final reckoning fall of good and evil for eternity now know i well how that fond fantasy which made my soul the worshipper and thrall of earthly art is vain how criminal is that which all men seek unwillingly those amorous thoughts which were so lightly dressed what are they when the double death is nigh the one i know for sure the other dread painting nor sculpture now can lull to rest my soul that turns to his great love on high whose arms to clasp us on the cross were spread sixty six to giorgio vasari vanity of vanities le favole del mondo the fables of the world have filched away the time i had for thinking upon god his grace lies buried neath oblivion's sod whence springs an evil crop of sins alway what makes another wise leads me astray slow to discern the bad path i have trod hope fades but still desire ascends that god may free me from self-love my sure decay shorten halfway my road to heaven from earth dear lord i cannot even halfway rise unless thou help me on this pilgrimage teach me to hate the world so little worth and all the lovely things i clasp and prize that endless life ere death may be my wage sixty seven a prayer for faith non è più bassa there's not on earth a thing more vile and base than lacking thee i feel myself to be for pardon praise my own debility yearning in vain to lift me to thy face stretch to me lord that chain whose links and lace all heavenly gifts and all felicity faith whereunto i strive perpetually yet cannot find my fault her perfect grace that gift of gifts the rarer tis the more i count it great more great because to earth without it neither peace nor joy is given if thou thy blood so lovingly didst pour let not that bounty fail or suffer dearth withholding faith that opes the doors of heaven sixty eight to monsignor lodovico beccadelli urbino per croce e grazia god's grace the cross our troubles multiplied will make us meet in heaven full well i know yet ere we yield our breath on earth below why need a little solace be denied though seas and mountains and rough ways divide our feet asunder neither frost nor snow can make the soul her ancient love forego nor chains nor bonds the wings of thought have tied born by these wings with thee i dwell for i and weep and of my dead urbino talk who were he living now perchance would be for so twas planned thy guest as well as i warned by his death another way i walk to meet him where he waits to live with me sixty nine waiting for death di morte certo my death must come but when i do not know life's short and little life remains for me fain would my flesh abide my soul would flee heavenward for still she calls on me to go blind is the world and evil here below or whelms and triumphs over honesty the light is quenched quenched too is bravery lies reign and truth hath ceased her face to show when will that day dawn lord for which he waits who trusts in thee lo this prolonged delay destroys all hope and robs the soul of life why streams the light from those celestial gates if death prevent the day of grace and stay our souls forever in the toils of strife seventy a prayer for strength carico danni burned with years and full of sinfulness with evil custom grown inveterate both deaths i dread that close before me wait yet feed my heart on poisonous thoughts no less no strength i find in mine own feebleness to change or life or love or use or fate 
unless thy heavenly guidance come, though late, which only helps and stays our nothingness. Tis not enough, dear Lord, to make me yearn, for that celestial home where yet my soul may be new made, and not as erst of naught. Nay, ere thou strip her mortal vestment, turn my steps toward the steep ascent, that whole and pure before thy face she may be brought. 71. A Prayer for Purification Forse perché d'altrui Perchance that I might learn what pity is, that I might laugh at erring men no more, secure in my own strength as heretofore, my soul hath fallen from her state of bliss. Nor know I under any flag but this, how fighting I may scape those perils sore, or how survive the rout and horrid roar of adverse hosts, if I thy succor miss. O flesh, O blood, O cross, O pain extreme! By you may those foul sins be purified, wherein my fathers were, and I was born. Lo, thou alone art good, let thy supreme pity my state of evil cleanse and hide. So near to death, so far from God, forlorn. 72. A Prayer for Aid De famiti vedere O oh, make me see thee, Lord, where'er I go, If mortal beauty sets my soul on fire, That flame when near to thine must needs expire, And I with love of only thee shall glow. Dear Lord, thy help I seek against this woe, These torments that my spirit vex and tire. Thou only, with new strength, canst re-inspire. My will, my sense, my courage faint and low, Thou gavest me on earth this soul divine, And thou within this body, weak and frail, Didst prison it, how sadly there to live! How can I make its lot less vile than mine? Without thee, Lord, all goodness seems to fail, To alter fate is God's prerogative. 73. At the Foot of the Cross Scarco d'un importuna Freed from a burdened, sore and grievous band, Dear Lord, and from this wearying world untied, like a frail bark, I turn me to thy side, as from a fierce storm to a tranquil land, thy thorns, thy nails, and either bleeding hand, with thy mild, gentle, piteous face, provide promise of help and mercies multiplied, and hope that yet my soul secure may stand. Let not thy holy eyes be just to see my evil past, thy chastened ears to hear, and stretch the arm of judgment to my crime. Let thy blood only lave and succor me. Yielding more perfect pardon, better cheer, As older still I grow with lengthening time. 74. First Reading A Prayer for Grace and Death Savien que spesso What though strong love of life doth flatter me, With hope of yet more years on earth to stay, Death nonetheless draws nearer day by day, Who to sad souls alone comes lingeringly. Yet why desire long life and jollity, if in our griefs alone to God we pray. Glad fortune, length of days, and pleasure slay the soul that trusts to their felicity. Then, if at any hour, through grace divine, the fiery shafts of love and faith that cheer and fortify the soul, my heart assail, since not achieve these mortal powers of mine, straight may I wing my way to heaven, for here, with lengthening days, good thoughts and wishes fail. 74. Second Reading a prayer for grace and death. Parmi che spesso. Oft times my great desire doth flatter me with hope on earth yet many years to stay. Still death, the more I love it, day by day, takes from the life I love so tenderly. What better time for that dread change could be if in our griefs alone to God we pray? O oh, lead me, Lord, O oh, lead me far away from every thought that lures my soul from thee. Yea, if at any hour, through grace of thine, the fervent zeal of love and faith that cheer and fortify the soul, my heart assail. Since not achieve these mortal powers of mine, plant, like a saint in heaven, that virtue here, for, lacking thee, all good must faint and fail. 75. Heart Coldness. Vorrei voler, Signor. Fain would I wish what my heart cannot will. Between it and the fire, a veil of ice deadens the fire, so that I deal in lies. My words and actions are discordant still. I love thee with my tongue, then mourn my fill, for love warms not my heart, nor can I rise, or ope the doors of grace, who from the skies might flood my soul, and pride and passion kill. Rend thou the veil, dear Lord, break thou that wall, 
which with its stubbornness retards the rays of that bright sun this earth hath dulled for me send down thy promised light to cheer and fall on thy fair spouse that i with love may blaze and free from doubt my heart feel only thee seventy six the death of christ non fur me mieti not less elate than smitten with wild woe to see not them but thee by death undone were those blessed souls when thou above the sun didst raise by dying men that lay so low elate since freedom from all ills that flow from their first fault for adam's race was won sore smitten since in torment fierce god's son served servants on the cruel cross below heaven showed she knew thee who thou wert and whence veiling her eyes above the riven earth the mountains trembled and the seas were troubled he took the fathers from hell's darkness dense the torments of the damned fiends redoubled man only joyed who gained baptismal birth seventy seven the blood of christ mentre matrista mid weariness and woe i find some cheer in thinking of the past when i recall my weakness and my sins and reckon all the vain expense of days that disappear this cheers by making ere i die more clear the frailty of what men delight miscall but saddens me to think how rarely fall God's grace and mercies in life's latest year. For though thy promises our faith compel, yet, Lord, what man shall venture to maintain that pity will condone our long neglect? Still from thy blood poured forth, we know full well how without measure was thy martyr's pain, how measureless the gifts we dare expect. End of section 5「Section 6 of the Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella, translated by John Addington Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6, Campanella, Sonnets 1 through 15. The Sonnets of Tommaso Campanella, 1. The Proem. Io che nacqui dal seno. Born of God's wisdom and philosophy, keen lover of true beauty and true good i call the vain self-traitorous multitude back to my mother's milk for it is she faithful to god her spouse who nourished me making me quick and active to intrude within the inmost veil where i have viewed and handled all things in eternity if the whole world's our home where we may run up friends forsake those secondary schools which give grains units inches for the whole if facts surpass mere words, melt pride of soul, and pain, and ignorance that hardens fools, here in the fire I've stolen from the sun. 2. To the Poets In superbia valor Valor to pride hath turned, grave holiness to vile hypocrisy, all gentle ways to empty forms, sound sense to idle lays, pure love to heat, beauty to paint and dress. Thanks to you, poets, you who sing the praise of fabled knights, foul fires, lies, nullities, not virtue, nor the rapt sublimities of God, as bards were wont in those old days. How far more wondrous than your fantasies are nature's works, how far more sweet to sing. Thus taught, the soul, falsehood and truth, descries. That tale alone is worth the pondering, which hath not smothered history and lies, and arms the soul against each sinful thing. 3. The Universe Il mondo è un animal The world's a living creature, whole and great, God's image, praising God whose type it is. We are imperfect worms, vile families, that in its belly have our low estate. If we know not its love, its intellect, neither the worm within my belly seeks, to know me but his petty mischief reeks thus it behoves us to be circumspect again the earth is a great animal within the greatest we are like the lice upon its body doing harm as they proud men lift up your eyes on you i call measure each being's worth and thence be wise learning what part in the great scheme you play four the soul dentro un pugno di cervello a handful of brain holds me. I consume so much that all the books the world contains cannot allay my furious famine pains. What feasts were mine, 
yet hunger is my doom. With one world Aristarchus fed my greed. This finished, others Metrodorus gave. Yet, stirred by restless yearning, still I crave. The more I know, the more I learn to need. Thus I'm an image of that sire in whom all beings are, like fishes in the sea, that one true object of the loving mind. Reasoning may reach him, like a shaft shot home. The church may guide, but only blessed is he who loses self in God, God's self to find. 5. The Book of Nature Il mondo e il libro The world's the book where the eternal sense wrote his own thoughts, the living temple where, painting his very self with figures fair, he filled the whole immense circumference. Here, then, should each man read, and gazing find, both how to live and govern, and beware of godlessness, and, seeing God all where, be bold to grasp the universal mind. But we, tied down to books and temples dead, copied with countless errors from the life, these, nobler than the school sublime, we call. O oh, may our senseless souls at length be led to truth by pain, grief, anguish, trouble, strife. Turn we to read the one original. 6. An Exhortation to Mankind Abitator del Mondo Ye dwellers on this world, to the first mind exalt your eyes, and ye shall see how low, vile tyranny, wearing the glorious show of nobleness and worth, keeps you confined. Then look at proud hypocrisy, entwined with lies and snares, who once taught men to know the fear of God. Next to the sophists go, traitors to thought and reason, jugglers blind, keen Socrates to quell the sophists came, to quell the tyrants, Cato just and rough, to quell the hypocrites, Christ, heaven's own flame. But to unmask fraud, sacrilege, and lies, or boldly rush on death is not enough, unless we all taste God, made inly wise. 7. The Brood of Ignorance Io nacqui a debellar. To quell thee, titan evils, I was made, tyranny, sophistry, hypocrisy, whence I perceive that what wise harmony Themis on me love, power, and wisdom laid. These are the basements firm whereon is stayed, supreme and strong, our new philosophy, the antidote against that trinal lie, wherewith the burdened world groaning is weighed. Famine, war, pestilence, fraud, envy, pride, injustice, idleness, lust, fury, fear, beneath these three great plagues securely hide, grounded on blind self-love, the offspring dear, of ignorance, they flourish and abide. Wherefore, to root up ignorance, I'm here. 8. Self-love. Credulo il proprio amor. Self-love fools man with false opinion, that earth, air, water, fire, the stars we see, though stronger and more beautiful than we, feel not, love not, but move for us alone. Then all the tribes of earth except his own seem to him senseless, rude, God lets them be, to kith and kin next shrinks his sympathy, till in the end loves only self each one. Learning he shuns, that he may live at ease, and since the world is little to his mind, God and God's ruling forethought he denies. Craft he calls wisdom, and, perversely blind, seeking to reign, erects new deities. At last, I make the universe, he cries. 9. Love of self and God. Questo amor singular. This love of self sinks man in sinful sloth. Yet, if he seek to live, he needs must feign sense, goodness, courage, Thus he dwells in pain, a sphinx twice sold, a false self-stunted growth. Honors, applause, and wealth these torments soothe, till jealousy, contrasting his foul stain with virtues eminent by spur and rein, drives him to slay, steal, poison, break his oath. But he who loves our common father hath all men for brothers, and with God doth joy in whatsoever worketh for their bliss. Good Francis called the birds upon his path brethren. To him the fishes were not coy. Oh, blessed is he who comprehendeth this. 10. Earthly and Divine Love Se Dio ci da la vita God gives us life, and God our life preserves. Nay, all our happiness on him doth rest. Why then should love of God inflame man's breast, less than his lady and the Lord he serves? 
Through mean and wanton ignorance he swerves, and worships a false good, divinely dressed. Love cannot soar to what it never guessed, but stoops its flight, and the thralled soul unnerves. Here, too, is man deceived. He yields his own to spend on others. Yet, in vile delight, God's splendor still shines through love's earthliness. But we embrace the loss, the lure alone love fools us with. That glimpse of heavenly light, that foretaste of eternal good, we miss. 11. The Philosopher Gran Fortuna El Saper Wisdom is riches great and great estate, far above wealth, nor are the wise unblessed, if born of lineage vile or race oppressed. These by their doom sublime they illustrate. They have their griefs for guerdon, to dilate their name and glory, nay, the cross, the sword, make them to be like saints or God adored, and gladness greets them in the frowns of fate. For joys and sorrows are their dear delight, even as a lover takes the weal and woe felt for his lady. Such is wisdom's might. But wealth still vexes fools, more vile they grow by being noble, and their luckless light with each new misadventure burns more low. 12. A Parable of Wise Men in the World Yostrology Ante Vista Once on a time the astronomers foresaw the coming of a star to madden men. Thus warned, they fled the land, thinking that when the folk were crazed, they'd hold the reins of law, when they returned the realm to overawe. They prayed those maniacs to quit cave and den, and use their old good customs once again, but these made answer with fist, tooth, and claw, so that the wise men were obliged to rule, themselves like lunatics to shun grim death, seeing the biggest maniac now was king. Stifling their sense, they lived, aping the fool, in public praising act and word a thing, just as the whims of madmen swayed their breath. 13. The World's a Stage No Teatro del Mondo The world's a theater, age after age, souls masked and muffled in their fleshy gear, before the supreme audience appear, as nature, God's own art, appoints the stage. Each plays the part that is his heritage, from choir to choir they pass, from sphere to sphere, and deck themselves with joy or sorry cheer, as fate the comic playwright fills the page. None do or suffer, be they cursed or blessed, aught otherwise than the great wisdom wrote, to gladden each and all who gave him mirth. When we at last to sea or air or earth, yielding these masks that wheel or woe denote, in God shall see who spoke and acted best. 14. The Human Comedy Natura del Signor Nature, by God directed, formed in space, the universal comedy we see, wherein each star, each man, each entity, each living creature, hath its part and place. And when the play is over, it shall be that God will judge with justice and with grace. Aping this art divine, the human race plans for itself on earth a comedy. It makes kings, priests, slaves, heroes for the eyes, of vulgar folk, and gives them masks to play their several parts, not wisely as we see. For impious men too oft we canonize, and kill the saints, while spurious lords array their hosts against the real nobility. 15. The True Kings Neron Fure Nero was king by accident and show, but Socrates by nature in good sooth. By right of both Augustus, luck and truth less perfectly were blent, in Scipio. The spurious prince still seeks to extirpate the seed of nature's born imperial, like Herod, Caiaphas, Miletus, all, who by bad acts sustain their stolen state. Slaves whose souls tell them that they are but slaves, strike those whose native kinghood all can see. Martyrdom is the stamp of royalty. Dead though they be, these govern from their graves. The tyrants fall, nor can their laws remain, while Paul and Peter rise o'er Rome to reign. End of section 6。section 7 of the sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella。translated by John Addington Simmons。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。section 7 。Campanella, Sonnet 16-30 to 30. 16. What Makes a King? 
chi panelli ave e colori. He who hath brush and colors and chance-wise doth daub befouling walls and canvases is not a painter, but, unhelped by these, he who in art is masterful and wise. Cows in the tonsure do not make a friar, nor make a king wide realms and pompous wars, but he who is all Jesus Pallas Mars, though he be slave or base-born, wears the tiar. Man is not born crowned like the natural king of beasts, for beasts by this investiture have need to know the head they must obey. Wherefore, a commonwealth fits men, I say, or else a prince whose worth is tried and sure, not proved by sloth or false imagining. 17. To Jesus Christ. I tuo seguaci. Thy followers today are less like thee, the crucified, than those who made thee die, good Jesus, wandering always awry from rules prescribed in thy wise charity. The saints now most esteemed love lying lips, lust, strife, injustice, Sweet to them the cry, drawn forth by monstrous pangs from men that die. So many plagues hath not the apocalypse, as these wherewith they smite thy friends ignored. Even as I am, search my heart, and know, my life, my sufferings, bear thy stamp and sign. If thou return to earth, come armed, for lo, thy foes prepare fresh crosses for thee, Lord. Not Turks, not Jews, but they who call them thine. 18. To death. Morte stipendio della colpa. O death, the wage of our first father's blame, daughter of envy and non-entity, serf of the serpent and his harlotry, thou beast most arrogant and void of shame. Thy last great conquest dost thou dare proclaim, crying that all things are subdued to thee against the Almighty raised almightily? The proofs that prop thy pride of state are lame, not to serve thee, but to make thee serve him, he stoops to hell. The choice of arms was thine, yet art thou scoffed at by the crucified. He lives thy loss, he dies, from every limb mangled by thee, lightnings of Godhead shine, from which thy darkness hath not where to hide. 19. On the Sepulchre of Christ. Number 1. O tu cami la parte. O you who love the part more than the whole, and love yourself more than all humankind, who persecutes good men with prudence blind because they combat your malign control. See scribes and Pharisees, each impious school, each sect profane, or thrown by his great mind, whose best are good to deity refined. The while they thought death triumphed o'er his soul. Deem you that only you have thought and sense, while heaven and all its wonders, sun and earth, scorned in your dullness, lack intelligence? Fool, what produced you? These things gave you birth. So have they mind and God. Repent, be wise. Man fights but ill with him who rules the skies. 20. On the Sepulchre of Christ. Number 2. Quinci impara stupirti. Here bend in boundless wonder, bow your head. Think how God's deathless mind that men might be, robed in celestial immortality. O love divine! in flesh was raimented. How he was killed and buried from the dead, how he arose to life with victory, and reigned in heaven, how all of us shall be glorious like him whose hearts to his are wed, how they who die for love of reason give hypocrites, tyrants, sophists, all who sell their neighbor's ill for holiness to hell. How the dead saint condemns the bad who live, how all he does becomes a law for men, how he at last to judge shall come again. 21. The Resurrection Se sol se ore If Christ was only six hours crucified, after a few years of toil and misery, which for mankind he suffered willingly, while heaven was won forever when he died, why should he still be shown on every side, painted and preached, in not but agony, whose pains were light matched with his victory, when the world's power to harm him was defied? Why rather speak and write not of the realm he rules in heaven, and soon will bring below unto the praise and glory of his name? Ah, foolish crowd! This world's thick vapors whelm your eyes unworthy of that glorious show, blind to his splendor, bent upon his shame. 22. Ideal Love Il vero amante He who loves truly grows in force and might. For beauty and the image of his love expand his spirit, whence he burns to prove, 
adventures high, and holds all perils light. If thus a lady's love dilate the night, what glories and what joy all joys above shall not the heavenly splendor joined by love unto our flesh-imprisoned soul excite? Once freed, she would become one sphere immense, of love, power, wisdom, filled with deity, elate with wonders of the eternal sense. But we, like sheep and wolves, war ceaselessly, that love we never seek, that light intense which would exalt us to infinity. 23. The Modern Cupid Son tre mil anni Though full three thousand years the world reveres, blind love that bears the quiver and hath wings, now, too, he's deaf, and to the sufferings of focid anguish turns in piteous ears. Of gold he's greedy, and dark raiment wears, a child no more, that naked sports and sings. But a sly gray beard, no gold shaft he flings, now that firearms have cursed these latter years. Charcoal and sulphur, thunder, lead and smoke, that leave the flesh with plagues of hell diseased, and drive the craving spirit deaf and blind. These are his weapons. But my bell hath broke her silence. Yield, thou deaf, blind, tainted beast, to the wise fervor of a blameless mind. 24. True and False Nobility In noi da seno Valor and mind form real nobility. The witch bears fruit and shows a fair increase by doughty actions. These and not but these confer true patents of gentility, Money is false, and light, unless it be bought by a man's own worthy qualities, and blood is such that its corrupt disease and ignorant pretense are foul to see. Honors that ought to yield more true a type, Europe, thou measurest by fortune still, to thy great hurt, and this thy foe perceives. He rates the tree by fruits mature and ripe, not by mere shadows, roots, and verdant leaves. Why then neglect so grave a cause of ill? 25. The People Il popolo è una bestia The people is a beast of muddy brain, that knows not its own force, and therefore stands, loaded with wood and stone, the powerless hands of a mere child guide it with bit and rein. One kick would be enough to break the chain, but the beast fears, and what the child demands, it does, nor its own terror understands, confused and stupefied by bugbear's vein. Most wonderful! With its own hand it ties and gags itself, gives itself death and war, for pence doled out by kings from its own store. Its own are all the things between earth and heaven, but this it knows not, and if one arise to tell this truth, it kills him unforgiven. 26. Conscience Secco ogni coi fa e dolia All crime is its own torment, bearing woe to mind or body, or decrease of fame, if not at once, still step by step our name, or blood, or friends, or fortune, it brings low. But if our will do not resent the blow, we have not sinned. That penance hath no blame, which Magdalene found sweet, purging our shame. Self-punishment is virtue, all men know. The consciousness of goodness, pure and whole, makes a man fully blessed, but misery springs from false conscience, blinded in its pride. This Simon Peter meant when he replied to Simon Magus, that the prescient soul hath her own proof of immortality. 27. The Bad Prince Mentola o comun corpo Organ of rut, not reason, is the Lord who from the body politic doth drain lust for himself instead of toil and pain, leaving us lean as crickets on dry sward, well, too, if he, like love, would filch our hoard, with pleasure to ourselves, sluicing our vein and vigor to perpetuate the strain of life by spilth of life within us stored. Love's cheat yields joy and profit, kings less kind harm those they hoodwink, so bear rock with seed, nor use our waste to propagate the breed. Heaven help that body which a little mind, housed in a head, lacking ears, tongue, and eyes, and senseless but for smell, can tyrannize. 28. On Italy. La Gran Donna. That lady who to Caesar came in state, upon the Rubicon, what time she feared, ruined from those strange races who appeared, erewhile to build her empire strong and great, now stays with limbs dispersed and lacerate. A bond slave, 
shorn of all her pomp revered. Nor seems it now that Dinah's shame can gird, Simeon or Levi, to avenge her fate. If then Jerusalem doth not repair to Nazareth or Athens, where did reign wisdom of God or man in days of yore, none shall arise her honors to restore. For Herods are all strangers. When they swear to save the Saviour's seed, their oath is vain. 29. To Venice Nuova Arca di Noe New Ark of Noah, when that cruel scourge of that barbarian tyrant like a wave went over Italy, thou then didst save the seed of just men on the weltering surge. Here, still by discord and foul servitude untainted, thou a hero brood dost raise, powerful and prudent. Do to thee their praise of maiden pure, of teeming motherhood. Thou wonder of the world, Rome's loyal heir, thou pride and strong support of Italy, dial of princes, school of all things wise, thou like Arcturus, steadfast in the skies, with tardy sense guidest thy kingdom fair, bearing alone the load of liberty. 30. To Genoa. Le Nymphe d'Arno. The nymphs of the Arno, Adria's goddess queen, Greece, where the Latin banner floated free, the lands that border on the Syrian sea, the Euxine, and fair Naples, these have been thine, by right of conquest, these should be, still thine by empire. Asia's broad domain, Africa, America, realms never seen, but by thy venture all belong to thee. But thou, thyself not knowing, leavest all for a poor price to strangers, since thy head is weak, albeit thy limbs are stout and good. Genoa, mistress of the world, recall thy soul magnanimous. Nay, be not led, slave to base gold, thou and thy tameless brood. End of section 7section eight of the sonnets of michelangelo buonarotti and tommaso campanella translated by john eddington simmons this librivox recording is in the public domain section eight campanella sonnets thirty one to forty five thirty one to poland sopra i regni high are those realms that make blind chance the air of empire poland dost thou lift thy head for while thou mournest for thy monarch dead, thou wilt not let his son the sceptre bear, lest he prove weak, perchance, to do or dare. Yet art thou even more by luck misled, choosing a prince of fortune, courtly bred, uncertain whether he will spend or spare. O oh, quit this pride! In hut or shepherd's pen seek Cato, Minos, Numa, for of such God still makes kings in plenty, and these men will squander little substance and gain much knowing that virtue and not blood shall be their titles to true immortality. 32. To the Swiss. Se voi più in alza. Ye alpine rocks, if less your peaks elate to heaven exalt you than that gift divine, freedom, why do your children still combine to keep the despots in their stolen state? Lo, for a piece of bread from windows wide you fling your blood, taking no thought what cause, righteous or wrong, your strength to battle draws. So is your valor spurned and vilified. All things belong to freemen, but the slave clothes and feeds poorly. Even so, from you, broad lands and Malta's knighthood men withhold. Up, free yourselves, and act as heroes do. Go, take your own from tyrants, which you gave so recklessly, and they so dear have sold. 33. The Samaritan. Da Roma ad Ostia. From Rome to Ostia a poor man went. Thieves robbed and wounded him upon the way. Some monks, great saints, observed him where he lay, and left him on their breviaries intent. A bishop passed thereby, and careless bent, to sign the cross, a blessing brief to say. But a great cardinal, to clutch their prey, followed the thieves, falsely benevolent. At last there came a German Lutheran, who builds on faith, merit of works withstands. He raised and clothed and healed the dying man. Now which of these was worthiest, most humane? The heart is better than the head, kind hands than cold lip service. Faith without works is vain. 
who understands what creed is good and true for self and others but none can doubt the good he doth his brothers thirty four hypocrites nessun ti venne a dir who comes and saith a tyrant lo am i and i am antichrist what man will swear the crafty rogue hiding his poisonous swear sells you what slays your soul for sanctity cheats brigands prostitutes and all that fry not having fashioned so devout a snare appear worse sinners than perhaps they are for where the craft's small small's the villainy you're on your guard the meek samaritan makes way before those guileful pharisees though god assigned to him the higher place not words nor wonders prove a virtuous man but deeds and acts how many deities hath this false standard given the human race thirty five sophists nessun ti verra a dire behold i am a sophist no man saith but the true sons of perfidy refined forge theologic lies the soul to blind calling themselves evangels of the faith aretine with his scoundrels blew his breath and in the cynic orgies boldly joined his ribald jests had flowers and thorns combined a frank fair list including life and death for fun not fraud it shames him to be found less vile than those who cannot bear to see their sink of filth laid open to the ground wherefore they shut our mouths our books impound garble with lies each sentence that may be cited to prove their foul hypocrisy thirty six against hypocrites Yafeti di Pluton. Deep in their hearts they hide the lusts of hell. Christ's name is written on their brow, that those who only view the husk may not suppose what guile and malice harbor in the shell. O God, O wisdom, holy fervor, well, of strength invincible to strike thy foes, give me the force, my spirit burns and glows, to strip those idols and to break their spell. The zeal I bear unto thy name benign, the love I feel for truth sincere and pure, when such men triumph, make me rend my hair. How long shall folk this infamy endure, that he should be held sacred, he divine, who strips in corpses in the graveyard bare? 37. On the Lord's Prayer, Number 1. Vilissima Progenie. Ye vile off-scourings, with unblushing face, dare ye claim sonship to our heavenly sire? who serve brute vices crouching in the mire to hounds and conies beasts that ape our race such truckling is called virtue by the base hucksters of sophistry the priest and friar gilt claws of tyrant brutes who lie for hire preaching that god delights in this disgrace look well ye brainless folk do fathers hold their children slaves to serfs do sheep obey the witless ram why make a beast your king if there are no archangels let your fold be governed by the sense of all why stray from men to worship every filthy thing thirty eight on the lord's prayer number two dove la libertà where are the freedom and the high feats that spring from fatherhood so fair as deity fleas are no sons of men although they be flesh-born brave thoughts and deeds this honour bring if princes great or small seek anything adverse to good and god's authority which of you dares refuse nay who is he that doth not cringe to do their pleasuring so then with soul and blood and verity you serve base gold vices and worthless men god with lip service only and with lies sunk in the slough of dire idolatry if ignorance begat these errors then to reason turn for sonship and be wise thirty nine on the lord's prayer number three allor potrete orar then shall ye pray with every hour that flies thy kingdom come and let thy will be done on earth as in the spheres above the sun when all we hoped and wished shall bless our eyes poets shall see their age of gold arise fairer than feigned in hymn or orison yea all the realm by adam's sin undone shall be restored in sinless paradise philosophers shall govern for their own that perfect commonwealth whereof they write the which on earth as yet was never known judah to sion shall return with might 
of greater wonders than shook Pharaoh's throne from Babylon to bless the prophet's sight. 40. A Prophecy of Judgment Number 1. The Reign of the Antichrist Mentre l'Aquila in Vola While yet the eagle prays and growls the bear, while roars the lion, while the crow defies the lamb who raised our race above the skies, while yet the dove laments to the deaf air, while, mixed with goodly wheat, darnel and tear, within the field of human nature rise, let that ungodly sect, profanely wise, that scorns our hope, feed, fatten, and beware. Soon comes the day when those grim giants fell, famed through the world, died deep with sanguine hue, whom, with feigned flatteries you applaud, shall be swept from the earth and sunk in horrid hell, girt round with flames to weep and wail with you in doleful dungeons everlastingly. 41. A Prophecy of Judgment Number 2. The Doom of the Impious La Scuola Inimicissima You sect most adverse to the good and true, degenerate from your origin divine, pastured on lies and shadows by the line, of Ties, Sinon, Judas, Homer. You, thus saith the Spirit, when the retinue of saints with Christ returns on earth to shine, when the fifth angel's vile pours condign, vengeance with awful ire and torments do, you shall be girt with gloom, your lips profane, disloyal tongues and savage teeth shall grind, and gnash with fury fell and anger vain. In Malabolge your damned souls confined, on fiery marl, for increment of pain, shall see the saved rejoice with mirth of mind. 42. A Prophecy of Judgment. Number 3. The Golden Age. Se fu nel mondo. If men were happy in that age of gold, we yet may hope to see mild Saturn's reign. For all things that were buried live again, by time's revolving cycle forward rolled. Yet this the fox, the wolf, the crow, made bold, by fraud and perfidy, deny in vain. For God that rules the signs in heaven, the train of prophets, and all hearts this faith uphold. If thine and mine were banished in good sooth from honor, pleasure, and utility, the world would turn, I ween, to paradise. Blind love to modest love with open eyes, cunning and ignorance to living truth, and foul oppression to fraternity. 43. The Millennium Non piaccia Dio Nay, God forbid that mid these tragic throes to idle comedy my thought should bend, when torments dire and warning woes portend of this our world the instantaneous close. The day approaches which shall discompose all earthly sects, the elements shall blend in utter ruin, and with joy shall send just spirits to their spheres in heaven's repose. The highest comes in holy land to hold his sovereign court in synod sanctified, as all the psalms and prophets have foretold. The riches of his grace he will spread wide. Through his own realm, that seat and chosen fold of worship and free mercies multiplied. 44. The Present Convien al secco nostro. Black robes befit our age. Once they were white, next many hued. Now dark as Afric's moor, night black, infernal, traitorous, obscure. Horrid with ignorance and sick with fright, for very shame we shun all colors bright, who mourn our end, the tyrants we endure, the chains, the noose, the lead, the snares, the lure, our dismal heroes, our souls sunk in night. Black weeds again denote that extreme folly which makes us blind, mournful, and woe-begone, for dusk is dear to doleful melancholy. Nathless fate's wheel still turns, this raiment done we shall exchange hereafter for the holy garments of white in which of yore we shone. 45. The Future Vego in candida roba Clothed in white robes, I see the holy sire descend to hold his court amid the band of shining saints and elders. At his hand, the white immortal lamb commands their choir. John ends his long lament for torments dire. Now Judah's lion rises to expand the fatal book, and the first broken band sends the white courier forth to work God's ire. The first fair spirits, raimented in white, go out to meet him, who, on his white cloud, comes heralded by horsemen, white as snow. Ye black-stoled folk, be dumb, who hate the loud blare of God's lifted angel trumpets. Lo, 
The pure white dove puts the black crows to flight. End of section 8「Section 9 of The Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella, translated by John Addington Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9. Campanella, Sonnets 46 to 60. 46. The year 1603. Giusto Mirando. The first heaven-wandering lights I see ascend upon the seventh and ninth centenary, when in the archer's realm three years shall be added, this eon in our age to end. Thou too, Mercurius, like a scribe dost lend thine aid to promulgate that dread decree, stored in the archives of eternity, and signed and sealed by powers no prayers can bend, or Europe's full meridian on thy morn. In the tenth house thy court I see thee hold. The sun with thee consents in Capricorn. God grant that I may keep this mortal breath until I too that glorious day behold which shall at last confound the sons of death. 47. Nebuchadnezzar's Image Babo di Sfata. The golden head was Babylon, she passed. Persia came next, the silvern breast, whereto joined brazen flank and belly. These are you, ye men of Macedon. Now Rome's the last. Rome on two iron legs towered tall and vast, but at her feet were toes of clay, that drew downfall, those scattered tribes erewhile she knew, for lords, now neath her fatal sway their cast. Ah, thirsty soil, from your parched fallow fumes a smoke of pride, vainglory, cruelty, that blinds, infects, and blackens, and consumes. To Daniel, to the Bible you refuse your rebel sense, for it is still your use to screen yourself with lies and sophistry. 48. The Dungeon. Come va al centro. As to the center, all things that have weight sink from the surface. As the silly mouse runs at a venture, rash though timorous, into the monster's jaws to meet her fate, thus all who love high science, from the straight, dead sea of sophistry sailing like us, into truth's ocean, bold and amorous, must in our haven anchor soon or late. One calls this haunt a cave of polypheme, and one at Lante's palace, one of Crete, the labyrinth, and one hell's lowest pit. Knowledge, grace, mercy, are an idle dream in this dread place. Naught but fear dwells in it, of stealthy tyranny the sacred seat. 49. The Sage on Earth, Sholto e Legato Bound and yet free, companioned and alone, loud mid my silence I confound my foes, Men think me fool in this vile world of woes. God's wisdom greets me sage from heaven's high throne. With wings on earth oppressed, aloft I bound, My gleeful soul sad bonds of flesh enclose. And though sometimes too great the burden grows, These pinions bear me upward from the ground. A doubtful combat proves the warrior's might. Short is all time matched with eternity. Not than a pleasing burden is more light. My brows I bind with my love's effigy, sure that my joyous flight will soon be sped, where, without speech, my thoughts shall all be read. 50. The Price of Freedom. D'Italia and Grecia. From Rome to Greece, from Greece to Libya's sand. Yearning for liberty, just Cato went. Nor finding freedom to his heart's content, sought it in death, and died by his own hand. Wise Hannibal, when neither sea nor land could save him from the Roman eagles, rent his soul with poison from imprisonment, and a snake's tooth cut Cleopatra's band. In this way died one valiant Maccabee, Brutus feigned madness, prudent Solon hid his sense, and David when he feared Gath's king. Thus when the mystic found that Jonah's sea was yawning to engulf him, what he did he gave to God, a wise man's offering. 51. Apology by Paradox Non è brutto demon. The devil's not so ugly as they paint. He's well withal, compact of courtesy. Real heroism is real piety. Before small truth great falsehoods shrink and faint. If pots stain worse than pipkins, it were quaint to charge the pipkins with impurity. Freedom I crave. Who craves not to be free? 
yet life that must be feigned for leaves a taint. Ill conduct brings repentance? If you prate this wise to me, why prate not thus to all, philosophers and prophets, and to Christ? Not too much learning, as some arrogate, but the small brains of dullards have sufficed to make us wretched in the world enthrall. 52. The Soul's Apology Ben se mila anni Six thousand years or more on earth I've been. Witness those histories of nations dead, which, for our age, I have illustrated, in philosophic volumes, scene by scene. And thou, mere might, seeing my sun serene, eclipsed, wilt argue that I had no head to live by. Why not try the sun instead, if not in fate unfathomed thou hast seen? If wise men whom the world rebukes combined with tyrant wolves, brute beasts we should become, the sage once stoned for sin you canonize. When rennet melts, much milk makes haste to bind. The more you blow the flames, the more they rise, bloom into stars, and find in heaven their home. 53. To God, on prayer. Tu che forza d'amor. O thou, who, mingling force and love, dost draw, and guide the complex of all entities, framed for that purpose, whence our reason sees, in supreme fate, the synthesis of law. Though prayers transgress which find effect or flaw, in things foredoomed by thy divine decrees, yet wilt thou modify by slow degrees, or swift, good times or bad, thy mind foresaw. I therefore pray, I who, through years have been, the scorn of fools, the butt of impious men, suffering new pains and torments day by day, shorten this anguish, Lord, these griefs allay, for still thou shalt not have changed counsel when I soar from hence to liberty foreseen. 54. To God for Help Come voi, ca buon porto. How wilt thou I should gain a harbor fair, if after proof among my friends I find that some are faithless, some devoid of mind, some short of sense, though stout to do and dare? If some, though wise and loyal, like the hare, hide in a hole or fly in terror blind, while nerve with wisdom and with faith combined, through malice and through penury despair, reason thy honor, and my wheel is skewed that false ally, who said he came from thee, with promise vain of power and liberty. I trust I'll do. Change thou the bad to good. But ere I raise me to that altitude, needs must I merge in thee as thou in me. 55. To Anibale Caraccioli A writer of Eclogues Non licida, ne drioper Like chorus, Lycidas, and Dryope, cannot, dear Niblo, save thy name from death. Shadows that fleet and flowers that yield their breath match not the love that craves infinity. The beauty thou dost worship dwells in thee, within thy soul divine it harboreth. This also bids my spirit soar, and saith, Words that unsphere for me heaven's harmony. Make then thine inborn luster beam and shine with love of goodness, goodness cannot fail, from God alone let praise immense be thine. My soul is tired of telling o'er the tale with men. She calls on thine, she bids thee go, Into God's school with tablets white as snow. 56. To Telesius of Cosenza Telesio, il telo Telesius, the arrow from thy bow, Midmost his band of sophists, Slays that high tyrant of souls that think. He cannot fly, while truth soars free, Loosed by the self-same blow. Proud leers with thine immortal praises glow, Smitten by bards elate with victory. Lo, thine own cavalcante, stormfully, Lightning still strikes the fortress of the foe. Good Gaeta bedecks our saint serene With robes translucent, light irradiate. Restoring her to all her natural sheen, The while my toxin at the temple gate Of the wide universe proclaims her queen. Pythia of first and last ordained by fate. 57. To Ridolfo di Bina, Seno et Amor. Wisdom and love, O Bina, gave thee wings. Before the blossom of thy years had faded, To fly with Adam for thy guide, God aided, Through many lands and diverse journeyings. Pure virtue is thy guerdon, Virtue brings glory to thee, Death to the foes degraded, Who through long years of darkness have invaded Thy Germany, Mother of slaves, not kings. 
yet gazing on heaven's book heroic child my soul discerns graces divine in thee leave toys and playthings to the crowd of fools do thou with heart fervent and proudly mild make war upon those fraud engendering schools i see thee victor and in god i see fifty eight to tobia adami portando in man holding the cynic lantern in your hand through europe egypt asia you have passed till at azonia's feet you find at last that cyclops cave where i to darkness band in light eternal forge for you the brand against abaddon who hath overcast the truth and right adami made full fast unto god's glory by our steadfast band go smite each sophist tyrant hypocrite girt with the arms of the first wisdom free your country from the frauds that cumber it swerve not twere sin how good how great the praise of him who turns youth strength soul energy unto the dayspring of the eternal rays fifty nine a sonnet on caucasus temo que per morir i fear that by my death the human race would gain no vantage thus i do not die so wide is this vast cage of misery that flight and change lead to no happier place shifting our pains we risk a sorrier case all worlds like ours are sunk in agony go where we will we feel and this my cry i may forget like many an old disgrace who knows what doom is mine the omnipotent keeps silence nay i know not whether strife or peace was with me in some earlier life philip in a worse prison me hath pent these three days past but not without god's will stay we as god decrees god doth no ill sixty god made and god rules the fabrica del mondo the fabric of the world earth air and skies each particle thereof and tiniest part designed for special ends proclaims the art of an almighty maker good and wise nathless the lawless brutes are crimes and lies the joys of vicious men the good man's smart all creatures swerving from their ends impart doubts that the ruler is nor good nor wise can it then be that boundless power love mind let others reign while he takes repose hath he grown old or hath he ceased to heed nay one god made and rules he shall unwind the tangled skein the hidden law disclose whereby so many sinned and thought and deed end of section nine Section 10 of The Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella, translated by John Addington Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 10, Appendices. Appendix 1. I have translated one canzone out of Campanella's collection, partly as a specimen of his style in this kind of composition, partly because it illustrates his personal history and throws light on many of the sonnets. It is the first of three prayers to God from his prison, entitled by Adami, Orazioni tre in salmodia metafisicale congiunte insieme. 1. Almighty God, what though the laws of fate invincible, and this long misery proving my prayers not merely spent in vain, but heard and granted crosswise, banish me far from thy sight, still humbly obstinate I turn to thee. No other hopes remain. Were there another God with vows to gain, to him for succor I would surely go nor could i be called impious if i turned in this great agony from one who spurned to one who bade me come and cured my woe nay lord i babble vainly help i cry before the temple where thy reason burned become a mosque of imbecility two well i know that there are no words which can move thee to favour him for whom thy grace was not reserved from all eternity repentance in thy counsel finds no place nor can the eloquence of mortal man bend thee to mercy when thy sure decree hath established that this frame of mind should be rent by these pangs that flesh and spirit tire nay if the whole world knows my martyrdom heaven earth and all that in them have their home why tell the tale to thee their lord and sire and if all change is death or some such state thou deathless god to whom for help i come how shall i make thee change to change my fate three nathless for grace I once more sue to thee, spurred on by anguish sore and deep distress. Yet have I neither art nor voice to plead before thy judgment seat of righteousness. 
It is not faith, it is not charity, nor hope that fails me in my hour of need. And if, as some men teach, the soul is freed from sin and quickened to deserve thy grace, by torments suffered on this earth below, the Alps have neither ice, I ween, nor snow, to match my purity before thy face. For prisons fifty, tortures seven, twelve years of want and injury and woe, these have I borne, and still I stand ringed round with fears. For, we lay all wrapped with darkness, for some slept the sleep of ignorance, and players played music to sweeten that vile sleep for gold, while others waked, and hands of rapine laid on honor's wealth and blood, or sexless crept into the place of harlots, basely bold. I lit a light, like swarming bees, behold, stripped of their sheltering gloom, on me, sleepers and wakers rush to wreak their spite, their wounds, their brutal joys disturbed by light, their broken bestial sleep fill them with jealousy. Thus with the wolves the silly sheep agreed against the valiant dogs to fight. Then fell the prey of their false friends in satiate greed. 5. Help, mighty shepherd, save thy lamp, thy hound, from wolves that raven and from thieves that prey. Make known the whole truth to the witless crowd. For if my light, my voice are cast away, if sinfulness in these thy gifts be found, the sun that rules in heaven is disallowed. Thou knowest without wings I cannot fly. Give me the wings of grace to speed my flight. Mine eyes are always turned to greet thy light. Is it my crime if still it pass me by? Thou didst free Boca and Gilardo. These, worthless, are made the angels of thy might. Hast thou lost counsel? Shall thine empire cease? 6. With thee I speak, Lord, thou dost understand, nor mind I how mad tongues my life reprove. Full well I know the world is neath thine eye and to each part thereof belongs thy love. But for the general welfare wisely planned, the parts must suffer change. They do not die, for nature ebbs and flows eternally. But to such change we give the name of death, or evil, whensoe'er we feel the strife, which for the universe is joy and life, though for each part it seems mere lack of breath. So in my body every part I see, with lives and deaths alternate rife, all tending to its vital unity. 7. Thus, then, the universe grieves not, and I, mid woes innumerable, languish still, to cheer the whole and every happier part. Yet, if each part is suffered by thy will, to call for aid, as thou art God most high, who to all beings wilt thy strength impart, who smoothest every change by secret art, with fond care tempering the force of fate, necessity and concord, power and thought, in love divine through all things subtly wrought, I am persuaded, when I iterate my prayers to these, some comfort I must find, for these pangs poison fraught, or leave the sweet sharp lust of life behind. 8. The universe hath naught that changes not, nor in its change feels not the pangs of pain, nor prays not unto God to ease that woe. Mid these are many who the grace obtain of aid from thee, thus thou didst rule their lot, and many who without thy help must go. How shall I tell toward whom thy favors flow, seeing I sat not at thy counsel board? One argument at least doth hearten me, to hope those prayers may not unanswered be, which reason and pure thoughts to me afford. Since often, if not always, thou dost will, in thy deep wisdom, Lord, best labored soil with fairest fruits to fill. 9. The tilth of this, my field, by plough and hoe, yields me good hope, but more the fostering sun of sense divine that quickens me within, whose rays those many minor stars outshone, that it is destined in high heaven to show mercy and grant my prayer, so I may win the end thy gifts betoken, enter in the realm reserved for me from earliest time. Christ prayed, but, if it may be, knowing well, he might not shun that cup so terrible. His angel answered that the law sublime ordained his death. I prayed not thus, and mine. Was mine then sent from hell? made answer diverse from that voice divine. 10. Go, song, go tell my lord. Lo, he who lies, tortured in chains within a pit for thee, cries, how can flight be free, wingless? Send thy word down, or thou, show that fate's wheel turns not iniquity, and that in heaven there is no lip that lies. Yet, song, too boldly flies thy shaft, stay yet for this that follows now. Appendix 2. The Rivista Europea of June 1875 publishes an article by Signor V. de Tivoli 
concerning an inedited sonnet of Michelangelo, which he deciphered from the autograph written upon the back of one of the original drawings in the Taylor Gallery at Oxford. This drawing formed part of the Otley and Lawrence collection. It represents horses in various attitudes, together with a skirmish between a mounted soldier and a group of men on foot. Signor de Tivoli not only prints the text with all its orthographical confusions, abbreviations, and alterations, but he also adds what he modestly terms a restoration of the sonnet. Of this restoration I have made the subjoined version in rhyme, though I frankly admit that the difficulties of the text, as given in the rough by Signor de Tivoli, seem to me insuperable, and that his readings, though ingenious, cannot, in my opinion, be accepted as absolutely certain. He himself describes the manuscript as a palimpsest, deliberately defaced by Michelangelo, from which the words originally written have to be recovered in many cases by a process of conjecture. That the style of the restoration is thoroughly Michelangelesque will be admitted by all students of Signor Guasti's edition. The only word I felt inclined to question is donne in line 13, where I should have expected donna, but I am informed that about this word there is no doubt. The sonnet itself ranks among the less interesting and the least finished compositions of the poet's old age. Thrice blessed was I what time thy piercing dart I could withstand and conquer in days past, but now my breast with grief is overcast, against my will I weep and suffer smart. And if those shafts, aimed with so fierce an art, the mark of my frail bosom overpassed, now canst thou take revenge with blows at last, from those fair eyes which must consume my heart. O oh, love, how many a net, how many a snare, shuns through long years the bird by fate malign, only at last to die more piteously. Thus love hath let me run as free as air, ladies through many a year, to make me pine in sad old age, and a worse death to die. Appendix 3 the following translations of a madrigal, a quatrain, and a stanza by Michelangelo may be worth insertion here for the additional light they throw upon some of the preceding sonnets, especially upon sonnets 1 and 2, and sonnets 65 to 77. In my version of the stanza, I have followed Michelangelo the Younger's readings. Dialogue of Florence and her Exiles Per molti donna Lady, for joy of lovers numberless, thou wast created fair as angels are. Sure God hath fallen asleep in heaven afar, when one man calls the bliss of many his. Give back to streaming eyes the daylight of thy face, that seems to shun those who must live defrauded of their bliss. Vex not your pure desire with tears and sighs, for he who robs you of my light hath none. Dwelling in fear, sin hath no happiness, since amid those who love their joy is less, whose great desire great plenty still curtails, than theirs who, poor, have hope that never fails. The Speech of Night, Caro Mel Sonno Sweet is my sleep, but more to be mere stone, So long as ruin and dishonor reign, To bear not, to feel not, is my great gain. Then wake me not, speak in an undertone. Lament for life wasted, Oime, oime, Ame, ame. Whene'er I think of my past years, I find that none among those many years, alas, was mine. False hopes and longings vain have made me pine, With tears, sighs, passions, fires, upon life's brink. Of mortal loves I have known every one, Full well I feel it now, lost and undone, From truth and goodness banished far away, I dwindle day by day, Longer the shade, more short the sunbeams grow, While I am near to falling, faint and low. End of section 10 End of The Sonnets of Michelangelo Buonarroti and Tommaso Campanella, translated by John Addington Simmons.